Very good. So welcome. So uh, I'd like to bring everything to order um, and uh, get underway. Um, so we're here this morning in a proper ordinary uh, council meeting to hear the submissions. Um, so I'm wondering just uh, one item, number one, uh, Karakia. Is anyone able to do a karakia for us? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, thank you very much, Acting, acting CEO. Julie, thank you, Julie. Tui e ki te Māori o te whenua, tui e ki te mana o te tangata, tui e ki te pono, te aroha, ki a piki, ki a iki, ki te taumata, tui e tāhi. Thank you very much, Julie, uh, uh, acting CEO. Appreciate that this morning. Thank you. Item number two, we have a uh, uh, apologies from Deputy Mayor, Councillor um, Taylor, who's in Christchurch, Councillor Lachlan. Normally sitting there, Mr. And any other apologies? Yeah, but anyway, uh, we'll take that uh, for Karen for lateness um, as well. Moved by Councillor Park, seconded by Councillor Williamson. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. As against, carry. Thank you very much. Okay, any conflict, uh, conflicts of interest? Uh, today, and there's no confirmation at the minute, so that's all good. So, number five, we have to hear and deliberate of the annual plan 2023-24 and fees and charges of the same years. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Sorry, <laughs> didn't hear that long. Kendall uh, Good is the senior policy advisor. Good morning, Kendall. Good morning, Mayor David and councillors. Thanks for coming along this morning. Um, thanks for coming along this morning. It's great to see you all here. Um, before we um, get started with our first matter, um, we were just hoping to resolve the first three um, recommendations in the report which um, are to receive receive this report and hear, hear and deliberate on the annual plan and the fees and charges, um, accept the late submissions um, listed there in number two and also receive, consider, and we requested hear um, submissions on the annual plan. I'm happy to move your worship. Thank you. Move. Yep. So, late submission. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Move and second by Councillor Park and Councillor mm -hmm. Rankin. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Yes. Carried. Great. Very good, Ken. And there is a slight change around in submitters. So uh, first up, we have uh, uh, um, Mr. Marcus Swinyard, uh, one one six busy rural landowner. Um, we've been allowed for Mark just to go first, and then it's going to be wrong. Okay, Mark, would you like to go in the hot seat, please? Thank you for your dispensation. Unfortunately, I'm working flat fish to keep the uh, state alive, but I'm about the only one that's doing that, so I'm sorry I'll have to shift you around. Okay, yeah. just talking on behalf of e the East Taupo group, firstly, the idea of deferring depreciation, we're totally opposed to that. You cannot continue to kick problems down the road because they in end up like the city of Auckland now an utter shambles because people have postponed and postponed and postponed. I appreciate the effects it will have on the rates, but it's a bad decision. And I don't like councils that won't front up to the, what has to happen today and push it. And a council, if you push it down the road, a council after you will have to put it right. So we're strenuously opposed to that. Secondly, we do not think you're land developers. The six hectares that you own should be perhaps sold to a developer certain sections of it sold to developers, perhaps with a tag to have a few modest houses in that particular area. But the trouble with councils being land developers, you don't hurt if you make, make a mistake. You won't lose your house. You won't have any obligations if you make a mistake. So we don't believe that you have the expertise. All council, council staff have the expertise to make this a guy. That's about all I want, except I want to bring before you 
I'm Rachel Kenny, who made a submission on behalf of Wairaki Township. I'm not adding to it. She made a brief submission about walking access for, for uh, the township. And uh, so you would have seen that in your printed stuff, and I cannot improve on that. Thank you very much, that, Mark. That's it. Thank you. Appreciate that, Mark. Thank you very much. Might be a couple of questions quickly. Um, Councillor Park. And thank you, Mark, for coming along today. And thank you for your community goodwill in serving on the East Rural Committee. And you're in your second term, so really appreciate your time. Um, firstly, a comment around Wairaki Village. I've actually walked through that area with a resident of the Wairaki Village, and I completely understand and and I'm happy to advocate for the, the accessibility idea. When it, uh, my question is, um, coming back to um, being opposed to the development of the EUL land, is it of your understanding that it's about infrastructure, it's pipes and roads, not council building homes and selling them? I understand it's about infrastructure. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dunya. Lovely to see you. And back to that is the first time you've ever called me Mr. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Love you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you for your dispensation. Okay, no problems okay. at all. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, yeah. next up we have um, submitter number 136, Rob Henderson. Rob, good morning. A little bit early, but I hope it's okay with you. <laughs> I can just sit here, I gather. Oh, yeah, yeah, just right. no problem. Yeah. Sit down and relax. Yep. You know, you all changed. <laughs> nice um, to see you, Rob. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to take my submission as read. I realise we've got a short time. I guess um, that provides an opportunity for councillors to um, either answer some of the questions that are raised in here, um, which is an ongoing dialogue with council staff about trying to get answered as well and I have asked elected members to weigh in on that some of those present have been copied in on that um, and also to um, ask any questions about the um, the issues that I have raised in general there that um, councillors might want a bit more clarity around I guess. Um, hi Rob, thank you. And as a former councillor, I know you're very aware of what these processes are all about. Very former. <laughs> <laughs> um, when it comes to rent remissions and whatnot, um, it's more of a long-term plan discussion than it is an annual plan discussion. Um, can I just, I know that you, you've been or you may still be a fly fisher and, and you are or were paying a commercial licence. Is this where your query comes from? No, this this submission is made entirely in a personal context, yeah, not in a business context. Okay. Um, can I ask you, you know, there's quite a bit of legislation involved around Māori land and what's rateable and what's not and everything else from central government. Um, can you perhaps offer what you think might be a solution? Um, that's a big question. Um, I think the first thing that would be in regards to that is what actually is the definition of Māori land? Um, and that's one of the questions I've been having an ongoing dialogue with some um, council staff and some members about. Um, I mean, it, to my thinking, much as that's not really relevant um, in many ways, is that, uh, you know, land that's jointly owned by many people and doesn't provide a commercial return and is non-commercialised, it makes sense to probably remit on that. But I think what's happened is there's a slippery slope going on here with what actually is the definition of Māori land. Um, and I know that in terms of the lake bed and the river beds, um, the policy is relentlessly justified on the basis that there's a um, you know, public right of access and that sort of thing. But I would point out that you know there already is a public right of access that's financed by central government. Um, uh, there's also fees for structures that public use on lake from DIA as well and that sort of thing. So, um, and the other part of that, of course, is that it seems that the um, the issue that doesn't really want to be discussed is commercial activity on the rivers and lake beds, which is essentially being operated like commercial property, just as somebody would rent a building currently, no different. So, Rob, um, with another hit on, I'm a Crown appointee on the Topol and Nui Management Board, which look after the recreational yeah. use of the lake. If this was to be 
operated as an entity because of the commercial aspect, which is a, in a different <clears throat> pot under mm. the Deer Settlement 2007. If we were to rate it, then, then we could lose the jewel and the crown from being access to all in a recreational sense. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's a hypothetical, which is based on the idea that the current non-rating of it <clears throat> is only a payment and a, a subsidy in return for that access, which is currently guaranteed through the Crown anyway. And are you aware that any council infrastructure that runs into the lake being full of hypes, yes. whatever? Yes I'm, glad, yes, I'm glad you raised that because when I first raised this issue with council, I was given a verbal that that was part of the reason for not rating it. My immediate question was to ask, had any estimate been provided when making that decision to councillors of what the cost of uh, Tuwhari Tawa choosing to then rate charge council for those structures on the lake? Um, I haven't got an answer to that as yet. So my concern with that is that in making a balanced decision and weighing up the pros and cons, you don't actually have any idea what the hypothetical cost benefit of the situation actually is, vis a vis to Funny Tower potentially rating structures on the existing lake bed. And on that basis, you can't actually make a decision that can be considered realistically to be an informed one. Uh, being a, a local and having connections with the community around the lake, have you spoken to anyone in Tufari Tower about this? Or is this you just bring it straight to council? Um, some of these questions were raised in a meeting I had with Tufari Tower in another capacity, not as a private citizen. Yeah. And um, during that meeting, I was asked um, and agreed to, although I did not receive the purpose of why I was agreeing to um, for the discussion during that meeting to remain confidential. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Williamson, through you. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, you know, we've as you had a couple of conversations. Appreciate um, your vigilance and following the um, what you believe. Um, but you know the drill. Obviously, at this stage we can't uh, qualify otherwise. Any any the um, your points at this stage until we at least we deliberate. Or and you also, I think you're probably aware. We are aware that we're looking at reviewing the review of the policy later in the year as well. So. <laughs> Obviously, I can't preempt any outcomes here, but we are doing a review of the policy. Yeah, that's understood. Um, I, I think just in response to the first comment there about um, my point of view, I'm trying not to put a strong point of view across here, other than I think that councillors should make decisions with all of the information in front of them and the ability to weigh up the pros and cons for the community. And I don't believe in this example that that's actually happening, and that's my primary and major concern. Thank you very much, Rob. Appreciate that. And we'll be deliberating and we will come back to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Submitter 100, Julie McLeod. An early? 58, Ross McKinnon. Connell? Uh, one, one, <laughs> no, David. David is here. I don't know if uh, David, are you keen to come up? Come up now. Yeah. Bit of a head, head of schedule, if that's all right. Yeah, cool. I'd like to hear what others have to say about that. Yeah. Where I am is quite a good spot. Sure. You'd like, you'd like to wait for a while there? Okay, cool. All right. Um, okay, we'll just adjourn for a minute until the next submitter arrives. Thank you. I Thank you. 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 Thank you.
No, it's not a wildlife sanctuary. You yeah. can't find a guided tour that has as few of them can you can just go to the zoo where they're using the trail and walk up to the sand. And they do human trafficking. That's where it reverts back to the weekly comments. If you go to this one, you go to the page. Good morning once again. We'll keep going if that's okay. Sorry, submitted number 100 is uh, Julia McLeod. Sorry, Julie, a couple of minutes earlier. Are you okay to go now? Well, that was actually what I was presenting on the way here. Is he? Okay. No, that's all right. We'll wait for wait for Ben if you like. Yeah. Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, Ross McConnell is not here by any chance. Oh, yeah. Ross, are you okay to come up now? Is that all right? Cool. Thank you very much, Ross. You are from the Kinlock, Kinlock Community Association. Submitter number 58, Ross, come and sit down. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, my name is Ross McConnell. I'm the president of the Kinlock Community Association. Um, our association has been involved in the Kinlock community since the 1960s. And uh, every year um, is, is eight committee members that are, that are elected onto the committee to represent our, our association and the greater community. Cool. I suppose my my pitch with the submissions or support to the submissions is not necessarily about 
what we've got and what we haven't got as far as the yes no from the responses is concerned. It's good to invite this council and um, officers of the Tablet District Council to come and talk to us more. Like, we've got a few um, submissions that we've put in and, and I'll go through them that I'm sure that that communication hasn't quite hit the mark and communication is is, is a two-way thing. It's yeah. we can put it down in writing, we can talk to you, um, but people hear what they think we say. Now, I don't think we are being heard and I'm sure the community isn't quite hearing what the council is saying either. So we need that that dialogue. We need a serious dialogue in order to get things for our community need without a dollar being spent. Okay. So um, there's a there's a few of them there that we've uh, that we've that we've, that, we've, that, we've, that I'll cover off. The first one that is a notable um, notable no was the Kinlock Road. Entrance to entrance to Kinlock. This has been a bone of contention for many, many years in the Kinlock community. It's the entrance to our to our community. We're a proud community, and we would like the entrance to our community to somewhat represent what Waraki Drive is to Taupo. You know, when you drive into Taupo and you come down the Waraki Drive, you're proud to be in. That doesn't go to the same thing for Kinlock Road coming into, into Kinlock. The condition of the road, where we water water pools, um, that's and it breaks up the road. It's 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 a cost. The mowing of the berms, all that sort of thing, it's been ignored to a large degree. Everyone thinks there needs to be a whole lot of money on it, but we need to start talking, and we need to start talking now about what what that can be for our community in, in years to come. It's not going to happen overnight. One of the comments on the on the um, pooling of, of water and that on the roads is that the poplars are, as it states here, um, the issue with Kinlock Road is the poplar trees which impact on the, on the drainage. The poplar trees don't impact on the drainage, especially on the opposite side of the road. I'm an engineer by trade. Water doesn't flow uphill unless you put a force greater than gravity upon it. So those poplars aren't affecting that. The whole thing needs a relook at. And we need those people to come and talk to us before we spend a dollar and do anything else. Okay. The poplars may be may impact on the solution. We grant that. It's no problem. But let's look for those solutions. And as far as the mowing is concerned, unfortunately, we may be a, a victim of our own of our own doing in some respects, where a footpath was put on to, on on the side of Kinlock Road. Prior to that footpath putting in, the golf course used to mow it, and it was kept tidy. Since that footpath's been in there, they don't mow it anymore, and the council have not kept um, those booms to the standard that it was, or the standard of the lines of Wairaki Drive. So we invite the council to come and talk to us about, about that. Parking on the Eastern Beach, um, actually anywhere along the beach. I think we've missed the, um, the communication has been, been lost here a little bit. Um, now, we're talking about the Scotsman's ramp in as far as um, that is concerned and impact that that is having on on the ability for people to park over Christmas. There was over 30 boats and all of them, I wouldn't say all of them, but this, the vast majority of them were over six metres long. Now there's clearly a sign on there not to use that. We need some way of, of making that ramp using for kayaks, jet skis or something like that. But when people can't go and use the marina that is there and park their boats and trailers along that road, that impacts on the, on the parking. So the parking space potentially is there, but we need some talking with the council. We need some, some work with the council to free up some of that space that's already there. Nothing new needs to happen there. Okay. On the western side in front of the store, 
excuses put up, it's not the council land. Well, we get that. We're all stakeholders in it. Our community is stakeholder in it. So is the Taupo District Council. So is Two Forty Tower. Let's all get together and talk about what we can actually do to make that a better, a better solution. So it's not just a no. We look. We're not looking at any money at the moment on this one here. We just need some action. We need some talking. So then, in future, um, resources can be applied. The community hall and domain. Once again, this has been a bone of contention for the community for a very, very long time. Depending on which way you look at it, some people would say it's unfortunate, but Kinlock is growing and we can we can all see that it is growing. The Kinlock Hall is the only community space building that we have. We don't have a monorail, we don't have any sports facilities around that. So we are making do somewhat with a hall that hasn't been fit for purpose for the last 10 years. We need some, we need people to come to the table and start talking about what that solution is going to be for that hall. Because it's beyond a small association doing much about it. It is a council asset and we want to work with the council to make sure that that asset is fit for purpose. Even fit for purpose for now and going forward. You know, the council has um, has played a big part in the growth of, of Kinlock. And therefore, those those resources that we have need to be upgraded also. It probably steps outside the, um, the scope of, of um, you know, infrastructure plans when, when subdivisions go in. But it is a bit of infrastructure that this community really needs. And to have a no put on there, um, say that we're not, there's no funding for it or whatever, at least let's have some talk about it. Because otherwise the next time submissions are coming, there's going to be no again. And in 10 years time, we're still without, without a facility that the community desperately needs. The corner of Kinlock Road, which was um, mentioned the court day, the um, intersection of Kinlock Road along the Tar Road, it was put in the submission with regard to on the, or actually on both sides, but predominantly on the left side as you're coming out of Kinlock. Um, it's often where people set up stalls and that creates an area for people to park and therefore the um, division down, down along the Tar Road is, is restricted and it is a bit of a hazard. Now, it has been said, yes, they're going to do something about this, but I'm not sure if we're on the same page here. I'm not sure from what is being put as a reply to the submission, and and all right, we will tighten up the corner to, to lower the turning speeds, improve the crossing for pedestrians, and improve the sight distance, also lower speed limits. Now, I suppose from a community perspective, we want assurance before a dollar's been spent that the the topic that was that was that was raised here is actually addressed. What are we going? What are we doing about stopping cars and that impacting that that view? You know, and is the proposed solution, whatever it may be, is that really going to fix the problem? So once again, we invite. The, the appropriate people to come and talk to us. So I suppose the, in closing, as a community, community consultations are great, but we've got to we've got to see results from that, and 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 create um, partnerships from organisations like us with with our with our council to achieve the results that our communities want. And I dare say there'd be many communities within Taupo would, would, would want the same thing. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you for taking the time to pay. Clarification of questions. Is that um, thank you, Ross, for your submission. Um, uh, I've been around the table for a few years, and that's the first time I've ever been invited by the KCA to actually come out and have a look at things. So um, I understand um, and I hear your frustration and apologies for that. 
but I think that council has been quite responsible in responding by establishing a Tinlock representative group with members from around the community and different associations. So, yeah, I'm a bit confused there. Um, also, well, um, so I, I, no, sorry, I understand, um, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, you're comparing a former state highway to a rural road, and we would all like that sort of treatment throughout. But are you aware of the multi million dollar water treatment plant that's being developed out there for the growing population of Kilok? That has not gone unnoticed from our community at, at all. In fact, that's and part of the submission that we, we actually acknowledge. We acknowledge that as a community. Um, so, but by the same token, you know, this is not, we want everything. Um, and last year's submission also acknowledged that and we had very little on our submission because of that. So. But as far as the K KRG is concerned, I mean, the KRG is our conduit between the community and and the um, and the council and which was instigated um, largely by the KCA and Cathy Guy um, back in the day, you know, to create that, that conduit. Where I suppose we are looking for now is stuff can come to the KRG, that's fine, but it's a delegation from the KRG to specific areas where expertise of those of councillors, officers, etc. come and talk to specific people in the community about those specific topics. At the moment, that's kind of that's all is that's all encompassed in in a, in a half hour to one hour sort of meeting every every couple of meetings from a community perspective. So it's just probably that extra depth that I think is that's required. That's a fair change. Uh, just a quick question around the uh, survey questions. Uh, what was the sum size of those surveyed within the Kinloch community? Um, the, the the ones that on in that we put in the submission. Um, if I remember rightly, we had. Um, I think. The exact numbers, I'm not sure. But it was in the tune of three to four hundred in, in that area. So from a community perspective, it's quite um, it, it's not a great sample of the, the 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 greater community, being that a large percentage of our community is holiday makers. Cool. Yeah. Pass the green slide. Thank you, Ross. Um, could you just tell me, please, what your uh, permanent residence and uh, your holiday home numbers, what's the numbers? Percentage-wise? No, the actual numbers. How many permanent residents have you got out there? Um, I dare say, with a bit of luck, this, um, the latest census will tell us exactly what those are, but it's estimated approximately a 1,000. 1,000. And, and holiday home owners? It's quite substantial, I would imagine. <sighs> Well, how how many people um, come to a holiday home? I suppose when it comes to that, but from a from a resident perspective, from a from a property perspective, or from a mm -hmm. um, perspective, we're sitting at around the uh, sixty five percent holiday homes to thirty five percent resident homes. Councillor yeah. Payne. Um, yeah, thank you, Ross. Just one other question around social investment. When you talk about playgrounds and the community hall and and whatnot. What attempts has the Kinloch Community Association made in fundraising to help do a partnership type arrangement with council to improve those uh, investments? Playgrounds, especially? Uh, playgrounds, the community hall. What proactive work has the KCA done to help engage with council to work in partnership to upgrade or um, replace? The, the hall, for especially a lot. The hall can goes back up a long way. Sorry? Can you tell me what sort of fundraising or um, initiatives you've undertaken to work with council in improving that? We um, have had we have had meetings with um, with the council um, prior to Gareth Green being the CEO, so it goes back a wee while. Um, and on on a number of occasions we had. Um, we funded um, feasibility studies on on the hall, etc. So we actually went a long way down down the path, and the council was was um, was fully 
um, fully involved in, in that process for one. The majority, like as far as playgrounds are concerned, um, that's probably something we haven't gone and fundraised um, specifically for that. The, uh, we have done a lot of fundraising with regard to um, the reserves. I primarily the Wamata Stream Show. However, that I understand, I know that's not council land, um, but that's so. It's not like we sit there and we want everybody to to give us. I'm not suggesting you're saying that either, yeah. but. Uh, from the whole perspective, a lot. One last question, Councillor Ring. Well, um, you mentioned the feasibility study. I think that was funded by, it was funded by a group, wasn't it? You applied for funding and got it for that feasibility study, but I've never seen the result of that. What's happened to the finding that came out of that feasibility study? Because I remember a lot of work was put into it, and I was part of that at the time, but I've never seen the end result. Are we able to have a copy? Oh, yes, so we can. Oh, that'd yeah. be great. Yeah. If I could formally request that you give us a copy of that feasibility yeah. study, that would be fabulous. Thank you. It'd be helpful. It was saying that was prior to... It was a couple of terms ago. Yeah. 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 But I've never yeah. seen yeah. it, and it could be yeah. really valuable to us. Um, it's actually quite interesting, like, the, the um, people that we engage to do so, uh, uh, to be fair, the latest or well, the the current um, currently there was a few of us that were on the committee um, or came onto the committee after it was that was in, um, that they were appointed. Um, there, there's some questionable results that they have come up with um, as far as like numbers, population numbers, and that sort of thing. You know, there's like I think they lost a little bit of a um, um, little bit of their way as far as reality is concerned. You know, like when, when someone says there was two and a half thousand people living in Kinlock, well, there's not too many people in this room would actually believe there's two and a half thousand people living in Kinlock right at this present time, you know. So there may be some helpful things yeah. though. Oh, yeah, no, there, there, was, there, was, there was. And as it was publicly funded, that would be really good for council to yep. see. So, yes, of course, we will balance that up. Yep. I'm sure there are things that are not quite <laughs> yeah. right in there, yeah. but there will be some things that might be really helpful. Yep. So I'd really appreciate that, Ross. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Ross. Appreciate your time around the ACA. You know, regards to all that, all the members out there. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in today. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. We have submitted number 100, Julie McLeod. And then, I believe. Right. This one pretty short and sweet. I think we've only got three points to to get through. The first thing uh, was our support of the East Durban Lands um, investigation work. It's certainly an issue for many of our members as far as the housing shortage goes and trying to find accommodation for their to um, satisfy their staff. Uh, so I think this investigative stage will just go a fair way to. Um, to assisting in the wider the wider problem for our community. Secondly, uh, we support council's um, postponement of the funding of the depreciation um, to support keeping rates at the level that you've got them at that increase. I mean, I, I think that that, sh as you pointed out, should only be a short term issue because there's obviously going to be some some fallback or whatever you're going to need to do to um, down the line for that. But um, and, we support keeping that rate as, as low as you can. And our final point, um, which uh, <laughs> was discovered at steering group last week, is something that we probably can't even ask for. So I'll just touch on it that uh, we <laughs> were supportive of council putting money in to finish off the, the predominantly the lighting and issues down at um, Robert Street in the Town Centre Transformation Project. But given there's only a, a bundle of money put against that cost, you don't have any uh, fixed terms, you, you, you're not able to. Chuck it in the annual plan anyway, is my understanding. So um, just when it does come to the table, I encourage councillors to really support it if they, in whatever form that comes as. Oh, Not even asking for any money, Matt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Um, thank you very much. No questions? No? Pretty clear and straightforward. Back to work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben and Julie. Next up, we have Mr. Rowan Sapsford. 
on behalf of the Total Advocacy Group. Yeah, yeah. 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 My kōmātua, um, kūrō masters, uh, for this kōpapa today. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to make a submission and, and talk briefly to our submission on the annual plan. Um, I won't read it verbatim. I'll go off the key points and then we'll um, pass it over to yourselves. Um, so one of the things we mentioned in the um, in the intro is we're currently um, getting a impact assessment done on the value of off-road trails to. Uh, the Topal District. So that's the wider Topal District, including Mungi Kino, Tirangi, etc. We've got a draft of that report, which is coming in with a dollar figure of about $19 million that uh, trials bring into local economy. We're expecting that to go up by the final response. So, and we'll share that report with you when it comes in. But I guess it just shows an insight of the value of trials. Um, financially, it doesn't actually cover the environmental benefits or the actual social and wellbeing benefits associated with trials, which um, we're certainly hearing a lot from, especially from those people that are quite used to or almost depend on a ride out of craters once or twice a week and now don't have that option. So, um, but I just looking at what we've said, Bike Topal funding, um, we really appreciate the partnership agreement that we have with Topal District Council and the funding we get. Um, and yeah, we'd just like that to continue. Um, we feel we've got a pretty good working relationship with the council, councillors and staff. Um, that relationship is based on basically sitting down and having a good conversation and identifying a good solution that complements both our needs. Um, we don't take that for granted, and I guess we'd just like to acknowledge that in the situations that we can. Um, the craters rebuild, so in our initial funding, we did say it would be good to have a little bit of putia to help with that. Um, we have received some funding from DGRT and I believe Topal District Council as well. Um, and what we have done is we have we will be using that to accelerate the rebuild at craters, um, and we will also we have also used that for a TIF application, which is a tourism infrastructure funding. So we managed to source about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars from the local community. Um, and hopefully the government will be able to match that to um, bring our rebuild time for craters down from six months to hopefully 10 weeks. Um, transport, again, we support the transport strategy, which was adopted by council a couple of years ago. Uh, we will support obviously the implementation of that, merge implementation of that, especially when it comes to the development of cycle and multimodal infrastructure, uh, including obviously finding a solution for the, uh, the Northern Gateway. That's me. Um, hey. uh, nothing really to add, but apart from um, congratulations, fantastic, mm. the Eastern Bypass, but plus all the connectors that are coming in. So it's, it's you know, from what to to uh, Crown Park to Super Five Mile Bay, new route coming into town. That's just fantastic. So it's not just a matter of building around the outside, getting the connectors. We're just about to start also connecting onto the Rotary Ride. We're going to do that down the side of OD Park. But there's some really good stuff happening, and that's just slowly but surely, bit by bit, we're getting there. And that's great. Thank you. Thanks, um, Firstly, um, I miss you guys. I miss sitting on your committee. You do fantastic work, and what we invest in you, we get. The output is spectacular. Can I just ask for clarity around the craters rebuild? Um, do you are you asking us for any funds for that, or you're no. just keeping us? We're really just keeping you informed. We have had some. We've had that 130,000 or thereabouts yes. of donations put in, if, especially if we get um, co-funding from central government through the TIF fund will um, make a massive difference in terms of just speeding it up. The interesting thing out of the craters being closed because um, of all the logging operations, et cetera, that are going in there, is that everybody actually realises what they've lost. So mm -hmm. a lot of people have taken for granted um, Craters Mountain Bike Park for the last 10, 15 or 20 years. Without it, suddenly they're all mm -hmm. got nowhere to go. And, and it is quite an intriguing thing. They're still going to go biking, but it, they, they have to drive to Rotorua or they drive to Tokoro. 
Yeah, and, and that's a really good point. And uh, like, I'm not a regular user of craters, but I miss it. Yeah. <laughs> so it just shows the impact it's had on the community. Is there any way that council can support you? Do you need an advocacy? We've we, we got a letter of support for application, and as I mentioned, we did get some funding via DGRT, which um, right. is greatly appreciated and made us um, a good impact on that TIF application. Yep. So we've been working with um, Libby and, and the staff to get that support, and um, yeah, we'll let you know if we get the funding. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. 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 Thank Your Worship, Councillors. Morning, well, my Councillor. I've got something to give you here that you requested in your submission. <laughs> it's not the mochaccino and chocolate fish, is it? No, it's some marshmallows. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> they normally go with the, with the uh, mochaccino. Awesome. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Sorry, that's a bit of a private joke. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Bernard. Good to see you. Welcome yeah. from Scotty Walker this morning. Yes. No problems on the travel in? Uh, well, no. You're lucky that I'm here because it's it's raining. I would normally be out on the bike um, cycling and taking the dog for a run and all that sort of thing. But uh, the weather being what it is, I thought I'd come here for the mochaccino, the pink marshmallow, uh, the, you know, the um, chocolate uh, muffin, and also annoy you people for a couple of minutes. No problems at all, Ben. Right All right, thank you. I won't bore you with uh, with you by reciting my written submission, which you have already read, but rather highlight some additional points for your consideration. There are two crucial excerpt, ex excerpts from your draft consultation document that I want to touch on. First, Council states that there have been uncontrollable cost increases across the board, including in basic items like fuel, electricity and insurance costs. We all know that Council does not have the sole franchise on cost increases. Every ratepayer in the community has to face them, as well as the additional price increases in food and health. Secondly, Council states, when we first forecast how much rates revenue we would need in 23 to 24, the impact of all the factors above meant we were looking at rates as at a rate rise of around 15% just to continue with our current work. We knew this would be unacceptable to the community. Yet under your current draft document, my proposed increase is going to be around 25%, equivalent of $1,021 in the coming year, which is just slightly less than my increase in superannuation, or if you like, 331% increase of the proposed average increase of $308. You can see my confusion. I'm left wondering whether your statement actually meant to say that the community would find it unacceptable if the rates were to increase by less than 15%. On a more serious note, in talking to various people, I'm yet to come across anyone whose proposed rate increase is going to be less than 15%. This is due to the fact that most, if not all, residential properties in our district experienced significant growth in value over the last three years to June 22. We all know that unlike Council, which is a monopolistic organisation, the average ratepayer does not have the ability to go to their source of income and simply demand an increase in order to meet their ongoing financial needs. I consider myself to be an average law-abiding citizen who over the decades has worked, worked and saved hard for my retirement, but have to tell you that your proposed rates increase on my property, in my view, is not reasonable or sustainable. Perhaps the time has come to reassess the methodology and formula used by Council to strike its individual rates assessment. 
While we're at it, maybe councils should also strongly lobby central government about a GST component, component on rates. As a point of interest, when I look back on my annual rates over the years, I found that in 2013, when my property evaluation actually went down, I was nonetheless presented with a rates increase of 5.4%. This would signal a bleak future outlook for, for me. Another point of interest is that, as mentioned in my email to you, there would be no increases in services to me, but in fact, I'm about to lose some views to, to the trees council has planted a few years ago without consultation. On your rates valuation, it is clear that views are part and parcel of the overall valuation process, which affect the final rates demand. My research shows that similar properties to mine, but without lack views and lack access, have attracted substantially different rates increases. In closing, please carefully consider the possible unintended consequences of your draft proposal as it is at present. Look closely at what is happening in Queenstown, where a lot of the locals can no longer afford to live in their own town. The end result is depending, depriving local businesses of their essential workforce and potential income, as well as losing our status of being one of the best towns to live in. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Appreciate that. Um, Councillor Park. Um, thank you, Bernard, and thank you for everything that you have done and are still doing for our community. Um, it's very much appreciated. Um, you, just to clarify, you're aware that the um, the revaluations, which are done every three years, and um, the revaluations for us, I mean, they're all based on June 2022 at the height of the market, are actually legislated revaluation process by central government. Yes. Yes, so do you think that um, in our consultation document we may have done a better job in talking about an average rate increase, but specifying based on legislated revaluations process? Would that have helped our community? Um, possibly, but perhaps uh, what I'm suggesting is that is it time to either lobby government uh, to we look or yourself look at the methodology and the formula that, that is actually used rather than using something that has been for quite some time. Uh, and I know that council uh, many years ago moved from a land based valuation to a capital valuation. Uh, now, is it perhaps time to also have another look and reevaluate whether that is still a fair I'm just putting out ideas uh, whether that is still a fair uh, and reasonable way to go, or is there another way of doing it? Sure. And can I also ask you, and I'm sure you're aware that there's a lot of legislative costs coming down or, or coming up from Wellington to us around solid waste, carbon credits, uh, compliance costs, building consents, everything that, that Wellington are putting a lot of pressure on councils, which are, are basically giving us a, a, step, a rate increase without even looking at what we must do, could do and should do. Um, and my other point was you agree with the EUL in your submission, you agree with the EUL land development. Um, as a former councillor, you would have been on council at the time when they were looking at the Victoria Drive Bower Lane sort of proposal. Uh, we're not we're not looking at going down that track of actually building places, but you agree that putting an in infrastructure is the right way to go, selling serviceable, serviceable, serviceable land. Yes, I do. Yep. Right, thank you. Cool, thank you very much. Any other points of clarification? No, good to see you. Cool, cool. awesome, yeah. thank That's you. It. Thank you very much. We'll We'll take some serious consideration of your submission and deliberate back in touch. Yes. Thank you very much. Bernard. I'll leave the plate. I'll just take those. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 106, Mr. Torben Landall. Yeah. Not here. Uh, 111, Mr. Glenn Muller. Mul 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 
Mr. Patrick Kane. Put the first cable back, please. Number 72 and a pound. Oh, okay. Can I? <laughs> okay. Slight adjournment until we. Good morning, Murray Wallace. By the way, a bit of background. I'm an engineer, retired, mind you. Had 50 years of it, and 20 of it was in local government. 15 was at County Engineer Rodney. Uh, then I did 10 years at Beckers and 10 years within Fulton Home. So, so good I, to have you here, Murray. Good to have you home. live in Kaipo now. You live here? And a year, 18 months ago, we shifted to Tapo. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, 12 months in our house at Wariwaka. Right. And uh, I think I know a bit about what you're talking about. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, First point, developer status. I think you've read my uh, submission. The point I want to make is that this is not core business development. And within, core, within your organisation, no doubt, you don't employ uh, developers. You, de you employ staff for the core business. You engage consultants or you engage other people to carry out the sort of development that you're talking about including development of a business case. Now, the sort of thing that, that I'm concerned about here, this is not core business. We're going into a venture which affects us all, which will be quite risky in the first five years. That's my understanding. We're looking at a slowdown in the development now. And the thing that I'm concerned about most is we're talking about development of affordable homes, affordable places. The sort of development, I've never seen a development yet, Auckland or out here, that has got affordable homes, built with affordable homes. Unless the local the developer has got involved in that sort of thing, uh, I can see it as a significant risk for the council. I think the rest of it I've written in there, one of my document. Deferring depreciation, I hate to be uh, a no, 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 but I'm being a no, no this morning. Depreciate, deferring depreciation is not a good idea. Defer, de, depreciation funds your rehabilitation, or goes towards your rehabilitation of your networks. Now your networks are your stormwater, your uh, roading, your uh, water and sewer. They all have significant rent networks. None at least in, in, uh, here in Taupo, there are water supplies all over the place, I see. Costs of the refurbishment of that are not seen, are not not seen. Look at what's happening around the country now with some of these things. Local authorities in the term that I was in local authorities, depreciation of yes, it was not even in, 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 a, in a major concern at all. We were actually having to develop uh, assets for the council and uh, looking at the best way to do it. We thought we were maintaining in perpetuity, but no, you don't. Every year you come up for argument about your maintenance requirements with the council and the council rightly set a level of rates that people can afford, but the downside is your networks depreciate and will continue to depreciate. Adding your depre this year's depreciation to next year's funding is a huge problem. You've got to include the inflation cost to go with, and then you've got to double up because it doubles up on your maintenance. Do I need to say any more about depreciation? I don't think I do. The last point I want to make is uh, I'm concerned about the development of Tongariro Street and the lakefront there. And it's mainly about the vehicle access that I'm concerned. The other rest of it is fantastic. The herringbone parking up and down or down Tongariro Street is not a good uh, engineering or public facility at all. Cars having to reverse out of car parks into main into a stream of traffic is not. Supermarkets don't even develop develop uh, human brain type parking areas. And yet, here we are, we've done it here. We've also got um, parking along uh, the, the lakefront. Uh, by that, I mean this fantastic development that's there. has now got people parking cars uh, and driving cars, even at a slow speed, in amongst other people who are sitting there in restaurants or children playing and uh, running across these areas. 
to my way, that, can, that is a major concern, the latter part. The only point I want to make about, about that is most projects of this dimension go through a safety audit, and the safety audit requires um, independent people coming in to carry out an investigation of what's there uh, and de determine whether, in fact, what's there is safe. That's all. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for taking an interest in the, in the town. Uh, truly appreciate it. And, uh, my uh, thoughts. Um, <clears throat> Tom, you're a street with the Aaron, but yeah. What's your issue with that? Well, you're ending up with a, an unsafe, uh, well, in my view, an unsafe uh, <laughs> lane, yeah. traffic lane, and people coming out of their cars, crossing, and they do. In fact, I've had happened to me where the two cars coming out of uh, posing uh, parking area, parking spaces and the line of traffic held up by this. You didn't hit someone, Mr. Mike. No, I haven't hit no. anybody yet. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't. But I then the, What's the, and the children, the children there too, uh, from across the road, coming and running across. And don't, children don't stay to, uh, and the younger ones don't stay to traffic walks and they dart out between cars. And if you've got cars on both sides uh, of you, um, uh, then it's a problem. The other thing about the parking is it's not confined to cars. You see motorhomes and uh, other longer vehicles parked in those spaces, and they far exceed uh, what I think you intended for those areas. Cool. Councillor Shepherd. Thanks, Mayor over here. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for your submission. Just a couple of points of clarification from me. Um, I'll start with the development of the EUL block. Are you aware that all we're looking at at this stage is just the civil earthworks and civil? So just getting the infrastructure in at this point. And if that is your understanding, it, is my understanding. If that is your understanding and you know on that. Yes, very Correct. much. Okay, thank you. My next question um, on the depreciation. Once again, we're, we're short funding by, or suggesting uh, short funding depreciation by 8%, yes. which is relatively... I guess conservative, yes. and your understanding is we're still going to be funding ninety two percent. Yes, well, yes, and you're st and you're still opposed on that basis. I'm opposed to it because although it might provide some relief to this year's uh, rate determination, next year's is going to be doubly difficult because you'll have that appreciation and the uh, inflationary costs uh, on top of what you've got now, Correct. and I see that'll be a significant thing. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. That's the okay. Um, thank you, Murray, and welcome to Topor. And I, it's great that you love being here and, and appreciate um, what a wonderful place we have to live in. Uh, my question's around uh, following Councillor Shepherd, because I sort of see a chicken and egg thing here, is that if we were to go ahead and only fund depreciation by 92% and, um, and instead of selling bare land, but developing the land with infrastructure and a roading network, that the um, the cost of that versus the outcome for ratepayers could then see a funding mechanism to help fill that shortfall of the only 92% of fully funding depreciation. So can looking at it from another angle, can you see the perhaps if there is a financial benefit through instead of selling bare land compared to selling serviceable land might be a better better and bang for buck for the ratepayer when and in this these hard times with cost of living and rates being based on revaluations taken at the height of the market last year um not being a good thing i do see i do see that um, there's obviously a benefit at the end, but I don't think the benefit is going to be as big as what you think it's going to be. Um, but this development is a tax taxable uh, thing. The council will be taxed, and therefore you need to set up its own development company or development entity to run the such thing. And uh, that's spoken. You've got to separate it from your current functions. The taxable thing means you've got to, go to declare quite a wallop. The second thing is that in your development of your land, the earthworks costs are the least costs. 
your services, your roading, your water, and your sewer, and all those other coming on to your bigger costs. You've got to talk about your um, overall costs, stage through. I see that's part of your intention. But to me, uh, it needs to be addressed holistically so that you are now seeing what what the, uh, what's possible. And you should be looking at your worst case situation rather than your best situation of these things. And knowing that you're going to get uh, these costs hitting you, um, and they will happen. Uh, I've never ever seen a development go so smoothly that you go through without any uh, hiccups in um, construction costs. We're getting it now with material costs. Uh, and over the years, uh, I must say, I've been through these and talking in the 50 years in the era of uh, previous governments. Uh, some of their costs were enormous. Uh, uh, and I can see why people now think that in the last five years we've had lesser uh, inflationary costs. Uh, and these things that come back and hit you uh, have not been as significant as they are now. If we could get a, a sort of crystal ball out and say, well, we're going to achieve that, uh, we'll sit well and good. I, I think it's a good. Good opportunity. I see the council's doing its best to try and keep rates at the right level. We've got to live within our means. So you defer your capitals to do your, to do the capital improvements to do the um, core work. If you don't, you're only adding more maintenance to your list by bringing in more capital work, and you it, it sort of a, goes around a big circle. So in actual fact, I. It's a mixed, mixed ball. I can't give you a definite yes or no. I understand. Thank you, Murray. Cool. Very good. Thank you, Murray. Thank awesome. You. And, and great. Thanks for taking the time out. No trouble. And appreciate it. Happy well, the last we hear from you. I'm disappointed that I couldn't uh, put more to it because I haven't been here long. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. No problems at all. Thank you. Good to see you. Okay. So, with a number 106, Mr. Torbone, uh, Torbone Landau. Welcome. Good morning, uh, Mayor, Councillors. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. Have you been swimming in the lake with yeah. Duncan? <laughs> you look good as a father of a newborn. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> What's a deceiving? Sorry, three. Three. Three boys, yeah. yeah. Three land or boys, that yeah. is a worry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome, Corbin, and good to see you from Two Mile Bay Dining Centre. I kind of continue down there, and uh, thank you for the season that we've just had uh, that you've provided to our visitors and, and well, alike. But I'll hand up to you. Uh, Lee, your submission. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It was uh, for me a good opportunity to come and um, have a chat to you guys. Um, I uh, um, see most of your various points, but um, I just wanted to get a little bit of clarification on um, the, give me one sec, um, the plan works for the Timwell Bay car park extension. Um, obviously I've submitted in favour of keeping that works in there, but I, I just want to get an update on if it's getting pulled out or if it's been deferred or what, what's happening first. Because um, I couldn't quite find that anywhere what was happening. It's um, obviously it says the project relates to an area outside Anchorage Resort and will be undertaken later in conjunction with wastewater and stormwater upgrades. Um, so I don't know where have you guys got a date on We're what still, date? We'll have to deliberate on that. I'm not too sure. Is it still in the plan? Yeah, it's so, still, so, still in the draft plan. Yeah. yeah. So we don't have a date at the moment, but it's, it's still on the on the radar to be discussed during the plan. Yeah. So be deliberated on top. So, but a little bit so I really so should be putting a lot of effort in here yeah, now, eh? You would like that done. Yeah, def yeah. definitely. Um, can you just give me a little bit more detail on on the plan works there? No, uh, no, no, no. Okay. All right. No, it's just a submission process here from you. What your thoughts are, and then. Okay, obviously um, it's relating to the stormwater upgrades and then in conjunction with that, the car park facility um, at the same time. So from where I stand with a couple of different hats on as obviously a business owner at Timor Bay Sailing Club, um, a user of the shared path, 
um, a user of the boat ramp, that whole area in Tumwell Bay over the last five, six years has seen significant growth. It's probably one of the most popular areas in Topol now. Um, with the shared pathway, a huge upgrade. Uh, a lot of um, the community use it. They use that car park that's out the front, uh, but we haven't seen any um, increase to the infrastructure around there for parking facilities, uh, whereas the demand's gone up significantly. So um, for me, it makes a lot of sense to keep that works in there and, and keep developing that area. Obviously, it's world class. Um, you know, we talk about destination management. Um, you know, it's it's a great opportunity to keep improving our offering to our visitors and our community. Um, and I think it's very necessary. I think you've all been down to Two Mile Bay on a on a Saturday or a Sunday, uh, and, and the car parking um, is definitely oversubscribed at times. So it's a perfect opportunity to utilise that bit of grass that's across the road in front of the anchorage. Um, get some car parking there for the boaties, the path users, and uh, for some of the patrons uh, wanting a pizza or a coffee. So yeah, very much in favour for that going ahead. Um, and I probably while I'm here, being sensible about when that happens is probably smart, not doing it over peak summer times when it's going to be at, you know high use. Winter times between May and October is probably a, a smart time to look at those works if you are going to look at it. Um, but uh, happy to give my feedback uh, in more detail if you require it uh, and work with you guys as much as possible to help um, in any way we can. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. We hear your message. Thank you. Thank you, George. Any points of clarification? No, good as gold. Thank, Thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. Thanks, Thanks We've got uh, submitter number triple one, Glenn Muller here by any chance? Oh. There he is. Morning, morning, David. Morning, how are you, Ancelis? See you. Start. <coughs> Welcome, Glenn. Thank you. I'm running just on time. Yes. My, my daughter just had a baby. Oh. Thank you, baby girl. <laughs> Name's Addison. Second grandchild. Second grandchild. Yeah. I know, it's good times. Yeah. Hey, Glenn, welcome on behalf of the Waikato River Trails uh, once again. Uh, Thank you. To see you and uh, the floor is yours for five minutes. Just a little presentation. Yeah. Where was the baby born? Uh, she was born in uh, Auckland City Hospital. Yeah. Very good. When how many years have you been with the river trails now? Uh, yeah. It must be like 12 years now. Yeah, yeah. Kind of seen it through from the beginning when, you know, under the John Key government. The capital was thrown out to the 22 great rides at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. how how old is the trail now? Um, it opened in 2011, so 12 years old. What we're finding now too, at this sort of age, um, we're kind of refurbishing. I think the the um, lifetime of the trail itself is probably about 10 to 12 years with the amount of traffic we've probably had. You know, over that time, in excess of half a million people on the trail, and with wear and tear, um, we're finding we have to upgrade. We've had a really wonderful gift recently from J Swap out of Matamata, who have been providing aggregate for our trail at two dollars a ton instead of eighteen dollars a ton, which is commercial rate. So in the last six months, they've donated sixty-seven thousand dollars worth of product. And it's just enabled us to do a whole lot more work in terms of upgrading the trail. It's been really amazing. Yeah. I'll pass it on. We've got a couple of local Jay Swap. Yes, please do. Here, so. Yeah, please do. Yeah. It makes a, you know, being a charitable trust, that sort of gifting makes a massive difference. And swaps, to be fair, aren't doing it for um, any commercial gain. They're doing it because they want to give back to the community. It's 
really I've taken notice by the dams on the right side, is it? The, yes. Yeah, where it goes alongside the road there, just yes. start the wear out of it. Then. Yes, yes. Yeah. Anyway, the floor is yours, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, just Uh, last year we did a photo shoot to upgrade our marketing collateral and I'll just take you through a few of these. This is at Atimuri village. Our photographer was very fond of the light first thing in the morning and last thing at night. So we, um, this is structured down by Lake Moraitai, a remnant of building the dams, quite spectacular. That's the conc concrete plant. Uh, the river, of course, we are the Waikato River Trail, so there are a number of camping spots um, along the river. This is just one of them. What goes up the top there? The tent? Uh, the, the people that sleep in there. Oh, they actually sleep in there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things we're doing uh, is positioning some artwork along the trail just to add value to the experience. This is a piece by uh, James Wright out of Clevedon. Another artwork at Lake Karapiro. By a local artist out of T Rail, Steve Clothier. Statoe 30, uh, Lake Fokamaru. We're trying to capture with these the grandeur of the Waikato River and its surrounds. Trail use in the last 12 months, whole trail's been just over 56,000 people. We have a counter just out of Mangakino, who've counted 21,000 odd people. Uh, the proportion is around. 70% cyclists, 30% walkers and runners. Uh, we continue to plant a lot of trees. We're planting 8,000 more native trees at Atiumuri this year, uh, all with volunteers. It's making a huge, uh, massive difference to the biodiversity along the trail. Uh, we've built some new trail just south of Atiumuri. Now, the story behind this, just the backstory, Waka Kotahi desperately wanted to get people doing the Kopiko East Coast, West Coast bikepacking ride off that piece of State Highway 1 from Oakiri Road to Atiumuri Village. Not a very nice piece of road. So they fully funded some development um, at Lake Atiumuri. Um, they channeled the funding through council. So we delivered the, um, the project, uh, council build, Waka Kotahi, and then council reimbursed us for the cost. So we've got five kilometres of new trail opening up um, Lake Atimuri to use us. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Claire Sharland was my go-to person there in terms of coordinating that from yeah. council's point of view. Uh, worked really, really well. Our next kind of goal on a maybe two to five year horizon is to get to Oreki Koreko. Uh, to connect with that, that um, tourist activity. Um, we haven't really made a start. We're going to need some funding to do the feasibility. So um, when that's available, we can get that underway. Um, just a side note, the Land Farm Group, ex Crafer Farms at mm -hmm. Artie Murray have been absolutely brilliant to work with. Like the, the management, the owners, uh, really welcoming because to build this trail we had to go through the farm numerous times so i can't speak highly enough of um of those farmers thank you for that thank you. uh we've got a new kind of gateway um onto the trail at lake Fokamaru, recently installed so cyclone gabriel it's heartbreaking to see what's happened at craters coming in this morning um, we had 122 trees down. Here are some pictures here. It took us eight days to tidy up. Um, you know, I really feel for our mates at Bike Topo around uh, the mess they've got to deal with here. But um, yeah, we're really proud of our response. It took eight days, uh, myself, my teammate, and an arborist to, to clear things up, mainly mainly wildling pines and pretty much at Lake Fokamaru. There was um, yeah, a bit of a wind event specific to that area. That's what it looked like. You'd be familiar with that. Uh, we've got some new signage, um, updated our branding last year. Um, so informational signs at every start and finish point um, along the trail. Um, one thing I'd like to discuss today and ask for some council support is to create a path 
from this new trail of Lake Road in Mangakino down towards the lakefront. Uh, we want to get people off the road. We want to be able to direct people from the lakefront, particularly with the redevelopment going on there in the coming years, up to this new trail. Um, there's a nice corridor there, which is the photo top right to enable that. And that's the footpath just outside Lake Maraito Lodge. So I think it's 480 metres long. This is what it looks like. Um, whether it be a sealed path or an aggregate path, uh, we'd really appreciate some support from council to um, enable this to, to really connect the lakefront with the, the trail that heads off to the north. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you. you too. <clears throat> Any questions, councillors? Just points of clarification. Yeah, councillor Westerman. Uh, very interested to know how you get your numbers for the tracks from uh, Magakino and the other bit. Sure. So when you travel from the lakefront at um, in Magakino, go past the golf course about 120 metres past the golf course, there's a little post that sticks out of the ground. And it's got some eyes poking out. Now that post measures everyone, and under the trail is a conductor, which identifies whether there's a bicycle. Every time someone goes past that, they are counted. And it's got 4G connectivity, so the data comes to me. The, the data also goes to the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, as does the data from the other 22 great rides. So they've got a, uh, a cumulative sum of people using trails rights throughout the country. That would just keep me awake at night. Yeah. You can't hear you there. <laughs> <laughs> You're being right. It's not a mystery. Being well, right. Mystery is solved. Yeah. Um, thank you, Your Worship. And Glenn, thank you for everything you've done in regards to the Waikato River Trails over the last 12 years. Just a couple of questions. Firstly, have you ever worked in collaboration with Bike Topo? Yes. You have? Can yeah. you give me an example? Oh, okay. Um, I was down at Lake uh, at Mangakino one day and Pete Masters was in his helicopter going up and down over a piece of bush that we were looking at building some trail in and he was taking photographs and scoping from his expertise. Mm -hmm. um, we attend, uh, we attended Crankworks with a cluster of um, Central North Island trails, including by Taupo. Um, the uh, feasibility study um, that we plan to undertake uh, around Awakuri to Oreke Kareko will be a collaborative um, piece of work. That's right, because they are, and you both have amazing organisations, so to do stuff in collaboration would be good bang for buck, I yes, would have yes, um, yes. So how much are you asking for of council for the off-road path? Uh, I guess it really what depends. What would you like? Okay. Um, well, I'll ask a question. Do we want it to be a, a, a concrete path or do we want to retain the style that most of our trail is, or all of our trail, which is um, compacted aggregate? It makes a massive difference to the cost. Okay. So, so for 10 grand, we can get an aggregate trail. It'll be three times that if it's concrete. Okay. So it's 10 to 30, I would suggest. And just out of interest, with the um, Mankino Lakefront Development Project, did you, did Waikato River Trail submit? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Thank you. And I guess one of the key things that we would like to see is permanent food and beverage because people on bikes, um, groups of people on bikes seek out hospitality. And I guess, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get into the whole, um, bus stop cafe thing, but there is a gap there now, and there's an opportunity as well for uh, food and beverage. Yeah, and, and I think and, and until that gap is filled, it's not going to be an ideal situation. Um, from a, a, a cycling and biking, ex, um, what are some small wins? Like what for cycling infrastructure, whether it be uh, like on the lakefront, we've got a sure. post where it's got lots of different tools for your bike and you can pump tyres up or... Is, is it, are those sort of um, small, quick win details catered for in Mangakino? Yes, they are. I think the wetness in Mangakino, Lake Maitai Lodge opened last year. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. The management is brilliant. The way it's been uh, upgraded is brilliant. 
the only weakness in Manga Kino at this point is that people that are staying when they want to dine out really don't have anything reliable in Manga Kino. And so I've talked to Gillian Smith, who's who's working, doing some great work down there, and the owners of Lake Maritai Lodge around, you know, people want certainty when they're booking an experience. I guess that's that's a gap, as is that food and beverage um, cafe style in, in Manga Kino. Yeah, sorry, Richard, there's one last thing. Have you had any discussions with Rick Keen from Amplify, which is like the business development or economic development agency for the total district? No. I'd suggest you get in touch with him okay. about your concerns. Thank you. 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 Thank was renewable and that would have still in that position we can do that but um like uh, was that did you say that was funded by Waka Kotahi fully funded yes okay um, I guess Waka Kotahi had some choices they could have either spent a lot of money on that two kilometers of state high one widening it creating a shoulder which would have made it safer for cyclists doing the bike packing east coast to west coast or invest that money in an off-road trail which has zero risk in terms of traffic. And so that's the decision they took. Yeah. I think they were going to do one or the other, and I, they made the right decision. Yeah. Very good. You mentioned the Araki Karako scenario. What, what space is that a feasibility? Uh, it's pre feasibility. We have a yeah. uh, $48,000 uh, cost to actually deliver that feasibility and to do it really well so we understand. Yeah. Costs of building, the impact on landowners, and full consultation with all landowners, including um, River Iwi. Um, we yet to we yet to locate the funding to undertake that piece of work. And like I said, it would be a Waikato River tra Trails bike topal collaboration to to um, to to deliver that. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Good to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see those. Uh, pictorials too. They uh, when you go out there and grab it. Aren't they? Yeah, there's a lot more on our website, yeah. uh, WaikataRiverTrails.com. If anyone would like to, to have a look. Councillor Truman just keeps smiling. Those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Right. Thank you very yeah. much for having. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank Cheers. You. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Number one hundred four. Uh, Patrick Kane. Is Patrick here? Uh, on behalf of the Kinloch representative group. Morning, Pat. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay. Councillors. Sit down and relax, and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. <coughs> um, well, uh, we've had quite a robust discussion, you might say, in Kinloch surrounding particularly the two questions, one of the land development proposal and the other the um, deferring of the um, depreciation fund uh, portion. Um, one thing I have learned is well, I've gained a lot of empathy for you folk having to make decisions because we, um, <coughs> the um, I'm taking the first question on development, uh, there is one view at one end saying not on, uh, it's not council business, not core business, get out of there. And the other end is just do it, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> and there was stuff in between. Um, and uh, I'm charged with reporting back on, on what our view was. <laughs> So <clears throat> I've delved a little bit further. Um, we sort of summarised by saying that um, it was a high risk environment, um, with no real promise of return. Um, uh, work might prove to be quite difficult in the current environment. Um, there was a feeling that selling the land as it is might be a um, more acceptable uh, pathway. Just, uh, getting some ready cash. 
Uh, however, it's been pointed out to me that there's quite a risk in that, and that um, uh, the purchaser might just sit on the land at a time when there is a very big demand for housing, and in particular social housing. So it seemed to me that the other thought that we had is starting to consolidate a little bit better. Um, that is a, a joint venture with, with um, seasoned developers, um, people who know the, know the ropes, know the area, uh, got the experience, know the risks. Because um, the, uh, there was also a view, rightly or wrongly, that it's not been council core business, it wasn't possibly the experience within the council. Whether that's correct or not, we don't know. So um, with that strong demand and um, the potential to avoid that land being just locked, um, the fact that there are good developers here with a, a social conscience and they know the area um, and they've got the experience, and also the fact that, that I understand there are funds available to put no impact on rates to proceed with, with that. So, we would suggest um, exploring that particular avenue uh, reference to others. Uh, regarding the deferring of the depreciation fund, um, there, there wasn't quite the same debate over that. Um, it was pointed out very clearly that, that um, we're talking a very small percentage, uh, but the impact on rates was significantly larger. So um, our view is a yes to that. Um, we do understand, as a previous speaker has said, that there are down the line consequences and that uh, there's a need for a catch up. However, it is a depreciation fund, so it's not an urgent catch up. Uh, in our view, that can spread over um, two or three years, maybe. So that's, that's your decision. Um, the third question that was put to us was the proposed fee changes, um, various things, and there was no no real argument over any of that. It was appreciated the work that's gone into keeping fees as, as low as possible, and the, the obvious attempt that the council is making to keep the rates low. So, um, Kinlock has a wish list. Which is pretty strong. Um, didn't, didn't feel that the annual plan was the place in which to present that. Uh, that's more to do with the long term plan, we feel. So uh, we can park that part of it for the moment. We do appreciate projects that are in the pipeline and, uh, and uh, very much appreciate the um, commitment of council to coming out to Kinlock, to council and councillors and staff. Um, uh, it's a, been a real boost in recent years to Kinlock to have that connection. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you for those kind, <coughs> kind words and appreciate your uh, time today and advocating on behalf of your community. Thank That's you. That's great. Now, there might be a couple of clarifications. Is there? No? Oh, I, I don't have a clarification. I just wanted to say thank you for the work that you put in. You guys are really mm. positive, particularly the Family Association. You're always looking for outcomes and solutions to the issues that we've got there, and it's a really positive contribution, and I really appreciate that, Pat. So thank you very much. Thank you. And if I may, ditto. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good to have you with a couple of Active councillors on the, yeah, on the case out there too. So, uh, no, lovely, lovely, Pat. I think we're proud as a council to be able to form that Kidmark and group and, um, as you say, get that connection, formal connection going, you know, and it's, it's the mural office. Yeah, very pleased to see that. No doubt we don't all agree all the time, but we get, the, get things done, hopefully. So, thank you, Pat. Good to see you this thank morning. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, true. Uh, 109, Mr. David, here's some. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. 
Good morning, Dave. Good morning, all. Mayor. Good morning, councillors. I've come prepared and apologies to you behind me because you're going to be looking at my back. I'm sorry, but I need to present this, which I hope you can see, David. We just maybe move it sort of right in there. I'm going to come into the ring. Thank you very can much. You, can you get that? Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. No, that's right. Oh, we'll get that start. I'll start, uh, start and then if we need, we might need to come up and have a, a close oh, so look. Yeah. I'm David Easton. I've been a resident of Hopeful for over 20 years. I'm involved with Project Pongarero, Green and Topo, Wicked Weeders. Used to play cricket for Talco Trouts until they imploded. And now I play for Ripper Art and West Clotics. Oh, which is fantastic. So good on you. And in fact, we made the final for, for our grade and played at Sydney Park. Oh, oh we So we're very proud of that being the smallest club in the district. Andrew Welsh still playing? And Andrew's not playing at the moment. Uh, he's not so well. Thank well, well, yeah. no, goodness. I've been to a couple of your matches, Dave, but I very much enjoy it. Well, thank you for your support for the match, Dave. Now, I'm interested in the East Urban region. I waited for this turn because I thought I may have some allies in the room, but I haven't heard anybody come up and address this topic. I understand there's a proposal now by Council to develop another six hectares in this east area for urban development. I'm definitely against that. I think we have enough development going on and we're losing all the green spaces close to the lake. Soon there'll be arrivals on the other side of the lake. We're spreading and spreading and spreading. So I'm going to ask Council to think about greater vision for a longer term for posterity. Now I know this area quite well. So we've got the botanical gardens, we have the arterial bypass, Mount Tahara, and further afield Opeki Bush. All very significant. We have this gorgeous area of rural land rolling hill country. I, I walk it often. I've had a close look at it since the proposal to put further development into the area and hence I'm against it. It has great potential for something for the future. Botanical gardens have an opportunity to expand into it. It's obviously a great place for recreation. It's a buffer zone from the urban development and the rural. It has an opportunity to, to create corridors of native plantings into Mount Tahara and to Opepi Bush. Opepi Bush particularly significant for its historical value. And I understand from what I hear that Iwi may be prepared to support such a program to link so my proposal here is to rezone this area from urban to rural. I feel that this area should be protected. If you look around the lake sides, there's not much of this land left. This is an absolutely fantastic parcel of land. It offers much. My proposal, to, as I say, is to rezone to rural, but within it, we could have an arboretum, like in Rotorua, where they have the redwoods, which are a big attraction to people. Within that arboretum is the possibility to have an exotic glass house for exotic plants. We could have a butterfly house. But with this, it brings visitors, not only to play on the lake, but there are people that also like to walk. So it's possible to have walking tracks within it. 
I'm not saying cycle tracks because we have enough of them. And as a walker, I'm constantly looking over my shoulder to see who's coming next on a bike. So I would say walking tracks, areas of grassland, special plantings, and in time, as I say, you could have other attractions within that area. I believe Māori would also be interested in this and would have a role to play as well. There's obviously other things that can be thrown into the, into the mix. And it's a, it's a uh, way of reducing our carbon footprint rather than covering another area of concrete ash belt and housing. It's got recreational, it's got historical, it's got cultural, and it's got other interests as well. So I'm asking Council to rethink this, please, and to think about a longer term project for future generations. If we look at arboretums, um, we could say the Kew Gardens being a big one, we could have something similar in this area. Obviously, it takes some time, and I can refer to the time that some of these trees take to grow. <coughs> but this is one of the trees in Rotorua, planted in the early 1900s, the redwoods, which are a huge attraction for Rotorua. And as you know, there are walkways, cycleways, and other attractions within that. So I'm asking for this to be area to be rethought and to be reconsidered. Thank you, Thank you very much. In the Canberra <clears throat> Regional Park in Auckland, Hungary. No, I haven't. No, so I think that's similar to what you made in years. It's a regional, they call it a regional park. I um, believe it a lot in Hungary and um, fantastic. They do have bike cycles. Yeah. No, no, that was just another sideline of uh, interjection. Okay, cool. Right, might have some points of clarification. So, just the, yeah, everyone said, understand the map. Yeah. The behind the botanical, botanical garden, the main green, all that green stuff. So, one of the things that concerns me is, is the development of botanical heights. Yeah. We've reached a point here now. If it goes over this ridge and into here, then we're starting to lose it. To develop another six hectares into, into urban development, you take another big chunk out of it. There are a lot of people living around it. Obviously, it's a great place for recreation for, for people, dog walking, walking, whatever, but it could be utilized into something else. There's also a gully here that's got a planting of, of conifers. I don't know what sort they are, but I would say they're probably 25 years old. So we've already got a start of, of a major planting. But that's something to be considered for the future. And you're aware that we obtained that land because of the ETA. We're approaching the government. And the idea was to sell down and find to go to the place to repay debt. But anyway, we will discuss that. Councillor Park. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, David. And um, I appreciate your passion and obviously the time that you've spent looking into this. Um, we've, we've got a housing shortage in Taupo. Um, so, what's, if, if we were to look at your proposal, could you think of where we might develop? other land for housing because we need more housing than right. it, without a doubt. It's a nationwide issue, but you know, the, the proposal is to help deal with that. So if we were to go with your proposal, have you got an idea of what our alternative might be? I'm just rolling up my sleeves. <laughs> well, you're a teacher. <laughs> my husband's name's David, so pulling up the sleeves doesn't. Well, I was sort of warned by my wife not to get into this territory regarding housing. Um, I wondered whether that question might be raised. Um, there are some very interesting issues within the housing uh, situation in Taupo. 
uh, housing shortage, crazy, isn't it? Um, the types of houses that are being built are monstrous. There's a gentleman before mentioned the smaller houses and possibility of those. I don't see very many. And I've also known some people that were looking for a small house, they couldn't find one. Um, we've got such a sprawl here. And I understand that the high percentage of the houses are holiday homes, sitting empty. So housing shortage is an interesting one. Affordable houses also questionable. I'm not going to get much further into this because it's not quite what I came to argue about. Finding another plot of land to put more houses on. Okay, I can't suggest that. I'm saying stop this being developed. There's not much of this type of land still close to the town where it's easy access for, for local people and businesses. It's got the possibility of something really marvelous for the longer term, not our generation, other generations. Finding another plot of land to put more houses on, I'm, I'm a bit horrified to be honest. When does it stop? This keeps going and going and going. But I believe, David, according to my wife, that you quoted as saying that 45% of the houses in this town are holiday homes. I see. I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, people are fortunate to be able to afford to do such things. Some of the houses going in currently are absurd. You can put three families in them. Two-storied houses on the lakefront, I find that also questionable. Have a look at Two Mile Bay currently. People's views are being taken. So I would like to see smaller houses, but where are you going to build them? That is a question which I can't answer, but not here. Yeah. Is it just uh, the six areas you're talking about, or are you sort of referring more to the balance of the EUL lands? I'm referring to all of this block here. And I'm not sure how the, where the six hectares is planned to be, but it, because there's access, access ways here, I believe it's in here, which is in the, is in the lower part of <coughs> Incredible views from here. Um, it would be a great draw card for people to visit, to walk in, experience certain things. And now to reach them, as I say, glass houses. And I'm prepared to leave my estate to a glass house to be built in there. If it comes to that, I don't have any dependents. So there's a start for some funding. <coughs> So that's my my point of view on this. Yeah, I'm 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 a little bit disturbed and sad that nobody else has spoken up about this. But I obviously see there are lots of other issues that council faces. Um, it's been very interesting to be part of of this morning. Um, I was hoping that the Maori would have something to say on this. I think they're an important partner in what happens here. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Certainly, it's the first, you know, I've heard about the city here, and that's for sure. Uh, we will certainly deliberate and have a good, have a, have a good look at that. Obviously, the works that are in the annual plan are not about the southern part of the EUL. You go down by the new jump down end, nowhere near that part there, but, but see, you know, it's our land, and, and um, certainly. Are you aware of the commercial application? On the go off sidetrack here on the corner of Nathan Focal Road and the Clean Energy Centre. Clean Energy Centre yeah. here, yes. Yeah. Might attend in here, this is commercial yeah. area, yeah. urban all around. Yeah. We've got um, Bonshaw Park up here, as you know. Yeah. I'm thinking that this is probably Maori land. There's also Pine Forest here. 
And as you can see, there are lots of gullies that will link up into this area. And we create the uh, corridors. Yeah. You can see that on the environmentalists. And my interest is in, in trying to preserve some of these areas, which are just disappearing so quickly. So please have a rethink about the planning for this area. Please consider the possibility of rezoning it and keeping it for a start as a reserve. Even if nothing gets done on it, it would still be a great asset. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. I could see those. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you very much. I'll leave them back to you if you like. Yeah, yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have submitter number 112, Terry. <clears throat> uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm not Terry, this is Terry. <laughs> um, but it is a joint submission, so we're helping each other out. Um, we don't have any visual props, just our faces. Um, we've got. Um, thank you. Um, two points that we want to. That, that are, we're not going to obviously read our written submission, but there are two points in there that we would like to highlight. They're actually very interrelated. Um, the first point is about the East Urban Lands Development. So Terry will speak to that and then I'll follow up. Kia ora um, Yeah, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Um, we don't represent anybody. We're just... Um, now, we did indicate in our submission support for the East Urban Lands Development, uh, but it's a qualified support. I guess that's what we just want to highlight real quickly. Um, we don't favor sell it, selling it to private developers at this point in time, um, particularly given the market cycle that we're in. Um, and we're, I'm assuming from what I read it, that this, this piece of land that you're talking about is just up above the countdown supermarket. Is that right there? For the if East, East Urban Land yes, Development, yes, just beyond it. It's East. not. It's not bordering the Botanic Gardens. Then. Okay. Um. Um. But we do favor <laughs> investing in the development of the land if there's insurance that they'll get a social um, demographic mix, um, social housing given proximity to the schools and things. Um, much of the current development up there is not at all mixed. So we think that's uh, something that would be quite useful. And um, we are aware that uh, developer imposed um, covenants are likely to impose additional cost and restrictions on residents in some of the new development here. Um, we support urban development in the area. Uh, and we know our community and New Zealand as a whole need housing, uh, but particularly housing is close to existing infrastructure and where good agricultural soils are not lost. We presume that that's the case with this. Um, therefore, if um, supporting council-led development, if council ensures there's a mix of housing, including housing not currently be provided by the market, or affordable housing, smaller homes, for retired people, first home buyers, that sort of thing. Um, so we support it with this, the idea that there's a social context involved. So, so in that sense, our, our submissions qualified. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I noticed one of the previous submitters indicated that developers may um, be in a better position to lead development, but I would say that we think councils can provide the leadership for that kind of environmentally um, friendly development and also um, um, development that is responsive to um, community needs. Um, it do, we do think that it is important for that kind of development to be climate friendly. And I do believe, we believe that within council and within the local government sector in New Zealand, there's increasing um, expertise capability around that climate friendly development. So I think that's why we're supportive of council leading that development. Moving on to the second point, picking up on that reference to climate friendly development, 
I think we've got a concern that overall there is not enough urgency and priority around greenhouse gas, gas emissions reduction and climate change adaptation in the draft annual plan. And looking back at last year's annual plan, um, there was a lot of emphasis on the impact of the pandemic, um, the global pandemic, and the impact on the operating environment for councils, both in terms of staffing, but also the impact on local businesses and supply chains and so on. And so we understand that, you know, that year, you know, the pandemic had an influence on what council could and couldn't do in, in a number of areas, including in terms of climate change adaptation and emissions reduction. All the same, there were just three references to climate change in that annual plan, and it was disappointing, but we accepted that the council was preoccupied with disruption caused by the pandemic. Um, and we've heard and seen in relation to this year's annual plan that our local, uh, um, well, we've heard in relation to last year and since then that our local economy has been quite resilient since the lockdowns ended due to our strong domestic visitor market. So we think now that we're out of the pandemic, there should be much more um, traction around climate change adaptation. We would like it to be given greater prominence in this draft annual plan. Um, or in the, in the annual plan that's adopted, given the evidence of economic risk that has been presented in other council documents, because it is an area that um, is increasingly creating economic risk. Um, so we need to be responding more proactively. Um, we're seeing changes um, in, our, in wider um, in, in, in government bringing in climate um, risk the uh, disclosures, mandatory ones for large financial um, corporates and elsewhere in the public sector. Um, so it's really important to be, um, again, be front footing this. Nowhere in the draft annual, annual plan consultation document are greenhouse gas reduction or climate change adaptation and mitigation mentioned. We think it's an oversight and that needs to be um, brought back into um, our optic. Um, we'd like to see increased funding in the draft annual plan for the climate change strategy, and in particular emissions reporting and reduction. Um, the strategy, the climate council's climate change strategy states that council will undertake an emissions and, and report results every three years. However, so far on the website, we only have the baseline inventory from 2018 to 2019. Um, we sense that there's still a bit too much complacency regarding climate change impacts. The strategy even can give a bit of a false sense of security by stating that Topol isn't as directly affected as places that are affected by sea level rise and cyclones, and that even if the risks increase for us, then, and this is what the strategy says, they won't increase as much as for other parts of the country. But having seen the destruction to forests in our district from Cyclone Gabriel, we think that this complacency is misplaced. The climate change, climate change strategy should be prioritised for a review in the wake of Cyclones Gabriel Hail and other storms we've experienced in the last 12 months. Um, the website states the council will be working to better understand the other impacts that Topol District may face due to climate change in late 2022 and early 2023. Um, we would like this annual plan to acknowledge that work and ideally be informed by it. We support the erosion mitigation projects around the lake shore, especially where um, it's, there's um, indigenous vegetation being planted. Obviously has benefits for water quality, stores carbon, decreases mowing. We encourage the council to consi consider climate adaptation and the potential for increasing intensity of storms um, when evaluating these projects. Um, we're also concerned that because of uncertainty around the resource consent for landfill, the district's landfill, um, the, the landfill continues to emit methane. In closing, just would like to see more analyses of climate risks and other risks that are associated with planned activities in the draft annual plan. Um, and we'd like to see that coming through more in the consultation document wasn't obvious to us, so that when we are being consulted, we can do so from a more informed position. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your time uh, being here today and for your very considered um, presentation. Um, we have a instruction from central government in regards to methane reduction at our tip, which you mentioned is still emitting. Um, can I just ask your perspective, would a rates increase be suitable to help cover the costs of that mitigation? Um, this is sort of what we're being directed as a direction of travel to try and remove that food waste out of the, the dump stream, essentially. Um, how, how, I mean, I know that this is just being questioned of you just at the moment. Would that be an acceptable thing or do we need to find another solution? Can I just hear your opinions on that? I think Council is doing some really good work in terms of education around separation of um, food waste and other recyclables and things that we can take out of the waste stream. So I think there's um, it, it's really important that there is education in the community about you know, reducing and um, diverting food waste. When it comes to that sort of simplistic thing of you know, how, you know, is it something that we should just cut rates for? I think that's something we can't answer. We need to see what the overall quantum of funding required is and what the other options are for the for funding that. But I think really, up, you know, increasing the education around free waste, hopefully that can happen within existing budgets. And um, one of the things that, you know, we mentioned, I think, in the submission, if not, Spoke, sorry, um, was, you know, again, with all that new development, with any new development the council's leading, putting in community um, community um, food composting facilities, um, local neighbourhood facilities and so on, which you're starting to see in a lot of the bigger centres because it, it, even Auckland, you know, it has to question you know, whether all its waste should be trucked down here. We're lucky that the eco gas facility is close and we know that eco gas facility needs lots and lots of food waste. But um, yeah, we we have to also um, not be dependent too on just one facility, um, and some of that can keep costs down as well by having a decentralised community. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Kelly, very good thank to see you. you. Thank you for taking time out. Oh, you sure. live in Tokyo? Yeah, yeah, yes, we yes. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I'm not sure really. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's good to have you here. Thanks okay, for taking thank time. You. Thank you. All right. Next seminar up, we have Joe Gera from Tidewell Business Chamber. Are you there, Joe? Hello, Joe. No, Joe. No, Joe. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
So if you don't increase the rates now yeah. and increase them later, we think that cost will still be greater than if you had the increase of rates now. Um, yeah, so those are our two main points. Cool. Um, just to support our submission. Anything else for you? Just, no? Yeah. <laughs> no, not today. She's nailed it. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you so much, ladies, and give our guests for Joe. You might be any questions of the chamber. <laughs> Councillor Park. Hi, Sarah and Jess. Uh, thank you for coming today. So good to see you. Um, just in regards to the rates or the depreciation of eight percent of um fully funding depreciation. Um. The, the the rates for the 2023-24 financial year are based on new revaluations, which um so did the chamber look at it from a uh, a perspective of what the actual hit on households would be as opposed to not playing catch up? Because we no no one wants to play catch up, right? But um did was it looked at from that perspective or was it just looked at look user pays, let's just pay it now. Yeah, from that, yeah. And because costs, infrastructure costs are going to continue to increase. So whether you delay it, it's, it's still going to be more expensive later on. So you may as well do the upfront now while costs are still lower than what they will be in the future and then try and play catch up later on. Yeah. Well, thank you. How, how are your members? Are they, um, you know, strong? Is the business community still strong, is it? Or is it? Yeah, I think, I think no, so. Yeah. 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 General feeling is okay. Yeah. 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 Hard to get started. Still an issue. Yeah. And then accommodation staff. Yeah. yeah. And then accommodation. <laughs> yeah. So we get hear your, hear your point. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much for taking time off work and see us today. Thank you for having us. Oh, catch you later. Yeah. All right. Uh, how are we going, guys? Mark Seymour. Mark's not here yet. Army. Brian and Glennis, gentle. Hello. Hi, General. Uh, Mr. and um, Mrs. Gentle um, won't be able to make it. They um, they have provided some written notes, which we will ha um, be on diligent, and I will also circulate too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So take them, them, them out of it. So we'll go. Okay. So we'll have a quick adjournment. The sandwich, and then we'll be back when Mr. Seymour arrives. Thank you very much. Lovely. Okay, uh, we'll reopen the meeting now. Good afternoon, everyone. Any new arrivals, welcome. Good to have you here. Um, next up, we have submitter 1110, Mr. Marcus Seymour from the Mangakina Palkani Representative Group. Mark, come forward, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, councillors. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to have a bit of a chat about one or two things. And don't worry, it's not full. It's only I put it in the get wet. Sometimes it is full. So we would like it your way today, Mark. Uh, not, as, not as bad as in town here. Oh, no. No one. Out there in paradise. It's just wonderful. But a cloud in the sky. Oh, it's just no wonder there's a lot of glamping and what have you going yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. That's what happens out that way. I good to see you, Mark, and thank you. It is good to be here, here, and I wish to thank the uh, council for uh, the support that um, uh, you people show me on Keno Pawakani. Uh, for those who don't know, um, uh, we have a little group out there. It's the support group, it's a representative group, it's a um, 
reasonably active as well, led by our councillor, Keith Truman. And um, we've got um, Mrs. Westerman and I think she's over there. Uh, and sometimes Anna turns up, or Anna is there as well. Sometimes Anna turns up. Great work meetings. Particularly questions that the councillors or the council was after was what should we invest an initial 7.6 million to doing some uh, um, uh, you know, land development? Um, and we, we think that you probably should. You already own the land. Um, some reservation, though, is of course, is we wouldn't want to see council go into it as a regular basis and be as in competition to the private developers. But you already own the land, so you might as well try to get us the best money for that land. Um, the next one was also about postponing some of the depreciation. <laughs> um, we have a bit of difficulty with that also, although we do support it. But what are you going to do? What, what's going to happen in year two? <coughs> Excuse me, I've had a jab for everything I was to have a jab for, but you can't seem to get in the spot with bloody cop and cold. I'm just <laughs> get over it. So, just <laughs> so um, what happens down the track? It's a little bit like the um, the um, petrol rebates or the petrol um, tax and the um, diesel surcharge the government's took off and now it's going to put back on. Oh, thank you. That's what I mean. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> we also support the uh, council model of the central government to broaden the criteria for rates rebates and to, increase, and to increase the value of the rebates. It's pretty important for a community like ours at Mount Kino to have those rebates. So um, if you can make them better, that'd be very good. We also support all the development that you're doing in the Mount Kino and Fokamaru area, basketball courts, lakefront developments, tree planting, and the Fokamaru water scheme. So it's a bit of a funny business here. We're all of a sudden saying you've got to sort of cut costs, but on the other side, we're also saying business as usual. So, you know, let's, um, let's make noise quietly. <laughs> uh, the Mount Kino Park County Representative Group supports the need for rural community halls to have appropriate contracts, uh, maintenance schedules, repairs carried out to ensure they are fit for purpose, and then utilise more. These hills, halls are the lifeline for our rural communities, a valued asset for the council and local communities they serve as a whole. It does appear to be a complete mishmash for rural halls, for the hireage system, the cleaning system, the repairs and maintenance system. It's pretty, pretty ordinary. So we've got to sort something out that's a lot better than what's there today. We also at Torahonga would like some more, um, uh, a, a ranch lighter putting in and a deck putting on the outside so that we can utilize um, areas a lot better in the summer. <coughs> um, and it would have been ideal to do it when you recladded the hall um, 12 months ago, in fact, yeah, 12 months ago. <laughs> but um, it wasn't done then. Um, oh, yes. We would like to also um, the dump station for the uh, uh, mobile caravans and what are the um, camper vans um, at the Mankina Sports Hub. Well, the dump station there, we believe it should be re relocated to a more suitable position. Um, <coughs> since doing up the sports in the <laughs> right side of the dump station, and it gets a lot more use, really come to the attention that you've got the dump station there, and we're actually right next to it. <laughs> so it really should be shifted. Uh, I'm surprised that we didn't actually see that when we upgraded or re rebuilt the sports hub. So if that could be relocated, that'd be really good. Um, we also support a district-wide solution for the AED units. It's not suggesting that we have a problem, but our servicing of these units is uh, pretty paramount to make sure they're going. Why have them if they're not going? I don't know if they're not going. We have one at Tura that we funded ourselves, and that too is a problem in itself because 
I know some of these units, and there's at least two types of units throughout the district. There could be three different types of units, all the same function, but different brands and makes and what have you. So I was wondering whether the council could get a more um, sophisticated or whatever else we do is to, to get those sort of things looked after, please. The group also would like to indicate to the, the community would like a new mower for the Montana Golf Club. They need a new greens mower. We're wondering if there's something the council could do. It's a small golf club, not a lot of members, very valuable to the community. And is there some opportunity there for them to get a green tomorrow, please? So thank you for the opportunity to make this submission. Um, I've got my way through it, but if there's any questions, thank you, thank you. Thank you. The, the, just before you answer the, um, <coughs> the depreciation subsidy, I think. Yes. What was your view on that again? Well, yes, I think you should be doing it. Should be doing it. <laughs> but what are you going to do? You know, when are you going to pick up that depreciation? It's a bit of a problem, really, isn't it? Because that means it's going to be a big, big lump the following year. Or, or do you extend the life of your assets for 12 months? Very good. Any other questions for Mark? The holes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, mate. Okay, nice to see you. Love yeah. to. Yes, I'll try. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You're not here, Linda, are you? No. Okay, so we're back. See you, Munch. Sorry, Councillor Rankin. Can I ask you just before we break? You know the motor mower that gentleman just did? Didn't we have a couple of motor mower last time? No, 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 no. It was all something, you know, because John and I got into trouble. Yeah, we got a we got a part of it. Yeah, attachment that goes on it, not a whole mower. So we can yeah. as staff we can clarify um, perhaps as we go on to deliberations. Um perhaps we can come back to that mower. Just um we purchased from the Kinlock. Yeah, that's where it's going. We purchased it. Kinlock. Kinlock on you. You're ready. My. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. I'm just going to put the screening back on. So. Um, and so uh, we also took the opportunity, although this is not uh, a long term plan year, we just did a, a kind of a first pass. Hey, we did this last year. Are these still the main topics that are coming up? And there's just a couple of tweaks there that I think reflect the recent year that we've had. Uh, so for those, I mean, I've been here a few times with you all, uh, but just in case anybody had kind of caught up with where cannot families trust fit, and I do appreciate those of you that are directly connected with our corner of the of the district. Um, the Kinlock Families Trust is a community group. We've grown to now over 1,270 members uh, in our Facebook group. Um, and we're committed to a new model uh, that we're trying to implement. And we do the same thing with each of our presentations and submissions that we survey our, our members. And that's what, what forms our submissions. 
Um, so moving away from the more traditional committee based approach. So hopefully everybody feels like they can have a voice. Um, and we really want to say we welcome the uh, Topo District Council Facebook group, uh, Facebook page onto our group um, and really looking forward to working with you further to help with the communications and also preparing for the long term plan um, work coming up. So onto the annual plan questions that you asked us. The um, EUL development was very much a split vote all the way along, and that really reflected our, our who we had in Kinlock um, with the staff, which we very much appreciated with the Kinlock representative group. Um, we actually put a third option in there um, because of the discussions in that group was why aren't we selling the land and, and paying off debts? We gave people all the options, um, and I just wanted to say I felt Councillor Shepherd gave us a really great view on why this was a good disposal for us. Um, but certainly the split, as you can see there, was, was pretty even um, across the board and certainly deferring depreciation marginally in favour, but it was very, very split on these questions. So good luck with your deliberations. And just this is the piece that I really just wanted to flag up with just the few moments we have together here. We went back out, like I said, we had surveyed over the last few years what are kind of our main items and we keep refining this down. And this year, and it's off a small base because this wasn't our main focus of the survey, so we haven't pushed this. This is very indicative only. But tree maintenance really shot up. It's always been pretty high, but I think yeah, that really reflects the cyclone effect. And certainly what we're seeing in our, our reserve, we did have one major tree go through a, a property in Kinlock, but otherwise, you know, pretty lucky, I think, in the scheme of the world. Um, but very high remains the improved school bus safety. And we haven't really made a lot of traction on that. There's been a, uh, um, a trial run, but we haven't kind of wrapped back on what that trial is supposed to be and sort of kind of left a little bit of no man's land there. Um, we've had some really great feedback from our community that walk from the Lyland Drive, Oakdale, Seven Oak side of Kinlock through about how they want to safely cross the road. Um, and there's been two or three suggestions on that, but that whole piece for us wraps together um, improving school bus safety. And I do know one great thing I've heard that our two of our younger community actually made a submission this year. So yeah, that, that's an achievement we figure. Um, the small supermarket commercial centre, we again appreciate that that is a, not a council piece, but what can we do to encourage and nurture that um, remains high as a facility given our growth. Um, and again, interesting, the beautification of reserves and roundabouts has come up highly, whether that's another cyclone effect or just generally, we like visit living in a nice place. Are we caring after what we have? And the playground review, I said over 70%, they squeaked in at just under 70, but I put it on there anyway because that's something that, that's really exciting that we, we're starting to work with the team. And I just want to say a big thank you to the staff who did some excellent work around talking about how we could do that and then looking forward to this year where we hopefully can together make that progress forward. So I just, in wrapping up, want to say, look, how can we help? What can we do with the communication? As a partnership, we very much see this as working together. Um, we want to help with that consultation. Like I say, I mentioned the two people making it a submission. They've never done that before. And I, I think that's something that we want to encourage everybody to be just clicking the button, getting it happening. Um, and looking forward, I think after a number of years around this process, we now get it. We have to start early on the long term plan preparation for us as a community thinking to make sure it's in your plans. Um, and, and we're just really keen to work together on that. So if you have any questions, um, I'll just leave that one there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, and great to see, see you and uh, all the work you do. It's been very constructive and always able to help. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. Might have a couple of questions if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Councillor Park. Oh. Hi, Belinda. I feel like I don't see you anymore. <laughs> John and not being here. Um, just around with your percentages of feedback, mm -hmm. how many people or responses did you have? Yeah, so we only had about 60 responses in there. That's why I'm saying it's very much indicative. We didn't push it heavily. Um, so I'm not sort of coming saying, hey, this is, this is absolutely telling us. I could do the maths for you in terms of, we did ask how many were in the households. So we had around an average of about three uh, per household that were answering those. So, yeah. And then the other thing, um, off, off the top of your head, how many playgrounds or just cannot have? Oh, 
five. Five. Of a varying degree. Right. So uh, we have, for example, we have the bare old one that was in the reserve that I think has been clearly shown to be like it's a stormwater you know, place, even when there's not a stormwater, it's really cold and frosty um, in the wintertime. So its ability to be used, and it doesn't have any shade in the summertime. So actually its use wasn't wasn't amazing, but it was lovely. And it's, it's kind of quaint, I guess, for those that have been drinking not for a long time, but it's not perfect. And then you have at the um, lakefront, there's a whole piece around the lakefront, and I'm really excited to be working through the northern on that not representative group uh, because I think there's something quite exciting to happen across that whole piece there. Uh, but again, that, that hasn't had any love for a while and more it's just had items taken away. Uh, we do have one of the ends of Bronte's place, you know, Kimberley Road, um, which again, great, but the toilets for the facilities from here there. I know that's been an item that came up in our survey. And then when we go over to, I guess, our really growing side of Kinlock, we've got the Lilac Drive, um, one which has the, uh, tennis courts next to it. I put in the um, basketball hoops there when I was uh, chair of the KC at the time. Um, and that's got a great model, but it doesn't have the accessibility for wheelchairs in there. I've come to learn that that's not actually, it looks accessible, but it actually isn't. And it doesn't have the shade either. Uh, and then our latest one in Seven Oaks. Fantastic, lovely little group. Um, small footprint is accessible, no shade. So that was, I guess, had to be one put in for uh, development purposes, but again, I'd suggest if we could put a requirement for shade in there, you know, for any of these new ones being built would be a great idea. So I guess we've got one that's awesome, um, the newest one, just a bit of shade needed. Line and drive, pretty good, but we really need to look at what's servicing, particularly that older area of Kinlock, which is kind of, I guess, our tourism area of Kinlock, if you will. So different, the two sides of Kinlock now in, the, in their profile of uh, have, so three quarters holiday homes in the kind of older part of Kinloch, as well as doing this on this side. And it really is giving a different view. So we, I guess, <coughs> won't preempt that review, but that's probably where the focus needs to be. Okay, good. 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 Uh, Councillor Lincoln. Just adding to the Mayor's comments, thank you very much for your positivity. I think your um, group was saying to Patrick, well, your group is very solutions focused, which we love, and we want to work with you on that. And the kindy is very exciting because it's going to be the hub of the community and that's going to resolve some of the issues and pressures that are there. Not all, but it will be a wonderful hub for the community. So thank you for everything you do. It's a very positive engagement and that's really appreciated. Oh, thank you very much for those comments. And I really appreciate the comment on the kindy because it did mean I forgot one one point was <laughs> we are, I hope Pat covered it, but we are now ready to, to come and, and look for a consent very so, shortly. So we will be taking your kind letter offer uh, of the previous CEO to, uh, to do that. So thank you. Councillor Westerman. Hi, Linda. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, I think the that you did the profile on. Did you do the split between permanent and holiday? I didn't this time, but I thought we would when we go in to do our full um, long-term plan work. We are planning to do quite a few more surveys this year and trying to get more engagement and just a better view than just mine. Because th honestly, sometimes the ideas do come up that aren't, that, that I don't necessarily agree with, but it's whatever they say, I put in there. That's what we're committed to. So um, yeah, we'll continue to do it and we'll make that split next time, I think. Oh, very good. Well, thanks once again, Linda. Good to have you here. Safe travels home. <laughs> oh, basketball is calling. Isn't it a great day for an indoor sport? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks, Appreciate it. Right. Next up, we have one, two, seven, Linda. Hi, Linda. Thank you for your comments. Um, just wanted to say that I think the weather out in the farm today. Uh, <laughs> I just got a few comments. Yes. I kind of talked to some councillors, which was appreciated. Um, question one, the subject of the sale of the East Urban Link. Uh, firstly, if you're going to sell a council asset, which is an asset of the community of Taupo, it needs to be done in the best interests of the community. After what happens throughout New Zealand and the world over the past three years, it is an easy conclusion to come to that ours and many other economies are overdue for a major recession, if not a depression. I do not want to see the resulting 
a resulting fire sale of a valuable council asset, we only need to look at the Kinloch subdivisions during the last real estate downturn to see how badly things can turn out. In my opinion, if the council wish to go forward with this proposal, they need to be prepared to hold onto the land until the real estate cycle is once again peaking. Owning the land and funding to do this project is no excuse for selling it on a low market. I mean, as you all know, the markets are already down. Uh, secondly, developing a six hectare uh, piece of land will put a major strain on our roading and other infrastructure. So I assume that's going to be quite a mission with yeah. 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 yeah, well, look at our roading now, how much it's our traffic, how much it's changed in the last few years. And you're going to start adding something like that. Well, well that is, is going to make a difference, isn't it? Um, and the other question, question two, I agree with postponing the depreciation fundings. Rates increases, another tax going up. People are struggling already, and I'm sure you realise that. Is there any discount, a chance of a discount on rates for people that pay the full year in advance? I'm, I'm assuming the council must uh, have some bank funding, and if people would be able to pay up early, it might be a place where both the council and the people could gain a percent, you know? Just would like to put out there that it would be nice that the council could do that. And that's the end of my submission. Thank you. I'm not too sure the legalities around that, but. Um, well, I'm quite sure we'll pay who council do it. Do they? Okay. Yeah. Cool. It might only be 1%, but they do it. Investigation. Appreciate the government. Uh, there might be some questions if that's all right, Lily. So you feel farming is still Rangitai? Oranui. Oranui, not at Rangitai anymore? No, I never was. Yeah. Oh, any questions, councillors? Be straightforward. Thank you so much for taking the taking the time out uh, to come. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for through listening to my speech. Yeah. Just to go to your own step. Uh, you guys are aware of the people on fixed incomes. Yeah, I'm not in that position because we're farming. We, we can't get that. Yeah, okay. Cool. Hey, thanks, Andy. Good to see okay. you. And thank you. Uh, Anthony Birchall. G'day, Anthony. G'day. How are you? Uh, yeah, not bad, I suppose. Um, yeah, so I'm Linda's husband. Yes. Yep. Nice, to, nice to meet you. I know your brother, Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice people, Luke. Okay, here we go. My concerns are how the TDC pro protect their people. The most vulnerable being the sick, the elderly, and children. We need the hospital and medical system as strong and confident as it can be. And having to travel for treatments long distances puts a huge drain and stress on families and resources. Pensioner flats needed are needed as much as possible. Previous pensioner accommodation may have been adequate, but as the extra population grows, the needs to be accounted for. This needs to be accounted for. Central government's healthy homes regulations will obviously put extra cost on existing flats to be upgraded. For me, council appears to put more importance on dressing up the look of the town than housing need of welding. Longer open public toilet facilities are very important for the elderly, especially like in close in, in a city or whatever you call it. Um, and council should not have the right to deny public access to these in the near called grandmas. Thank you. 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 Thank you
employee vaccination status. Uh, young girls in your facilities, i.e. the AC baths changing room, should not be subjected to males entering and undressing. This woke agenda should not be endorsed by the local council. All councils in New Zealand should be taking a stand against this happening, regardless of central government's policy. Any male, born a male, not wanting to use the male's changing rooms should be using the family changing rooms, not the female. Central government is launching a new offensive to push radical sexuality and gender ideology into schools from year one. And if you want to learn more, you can go and search familyfirst.org.nz. This agenda is worldwide through the Western countries only and is designed to sexualise children from a young age and teaches them to question whether or not they have the correct gender, resulting in many children using puberty blockers and leading to gender surgery. True definition is castration and sexual mutation. This is the woke agenda, which uses the rainbow flag as their symbolism. Taupo District Council to use on a pedestrian crossing, does this mean they support this agenda? Wokeism is a Trojan horse of pedophilia. You have the opportunity to show your empathy and stop the rollout of this agenda. Thank you, Thank you very much, Anthony. Appreciate it. No submission today. Uh, might be a couple of questions. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any, any questions, friends? No, 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 Thank you for the funding you provide to the Topo District Creative Community. Some of the amazing groups and events you have supported are shown on the screen. Thank you for your support of the Creative Community in other ways through your partnership agreements with various groups in the districts and other funding and support you provide. I would also like to say thank you to Briar Forlong and Peter Boyd for the work that they are currently doing with the Creative Community and Rose Press for the work she undertook in the years she was working with us. Thank you for your continued support of the Waipahihi Youth Arts Centre, whose lease I understand is currently under review. Arts, culture and creativity are essential infrastructures for healthy, vibrant communities where people want to live, work and raise their families. As Andrew outlined in our submission, the ratio of money requested by the community to the amount of funding available through Creative Topol is usually five to one. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> Sorry, we kicked off a bit keen. We kicked off a bit early. We come and sit down, sir. So Holly's doing a sterling job here in the middle. Yes, We would like you to consider an increase of the level of grant funding provided to Creative Total. The creative community have taken the opportunity to discuss their thoughts and ideas on the future through the process of developing the Topo District Council Arts and Culture Action Plan. This has resulted in a template of actions that can strengthen our arts and culture within the community. The community is hungry to collectivise and collaborate. The largest barrier to development of the creative community is time and expertise. Volunteer time and expertise is a precious and limited resource, and to achieve the goals outlined in the action plan, a paid position focused on achieving outcomes for the creative community is imperative. We urge you to implement action points 2.2 to 2.4 to begin this journey. Allocation of staff resourcing, be it a direct council employee or funding for an external group such as Creative Topol to undertake such resourcing will be necessary to achieve many of the action points in this plan. While some action points will take many years to implement, such as an arts and culture hub, there are some that can be implemented quite quickly and will have large impact, such as a purpose-built arts website 
focusing on capturing and sharing knowledge in a centralized manner. In conclusion, our two asks today are to consider increasing Creative Topos grant funding and to consider funding a paid position focusing on the action points of the Arts and Culture Action Plan. Investment in arts, culture and creativity is an investment in people and in community well-being. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Appreciate it, Matt. Ed Wright. Uh, thank you for all the work that you you do in the community, i.e. airport opening and so oh, yeah. all that sort of thing. So, uh, cool. Hey, good to see you, Andrew. Welcome, former councillor. Yeah, uh, nice to see you. Have you got anything to add to that, Andrew, at all? Um, just a couple of things. Um, just the important thing is, uh, um, and which has been emphasised by me and my in, in our submission, and um, again by Holly, is that uh, um, we need that grant for the arts, and uh, we hope that uh, you will not have any, um, will, will not consider uh, decreasing it, and uh, hopefully you may consider um, in, in increasing that grant because it's invaluable. And as you can see from the uh, slideshow that uh, Holly has presented there, that, that there's so many activities that we that we support um, through your generous grant to us, which we redistribute to the community. So it's it's, it's invaluable. Um, on many occasions in the past, we've talked about um, the employment of an art worker. And um, I have to uh, um, note that in the past, we've also um, informed you and you've uh, acknowledged that there is uh, a quite an, uh, a difference in the support for the arts as opposed to, to, to sport. And um, we, we note that you have... Um, continue to support the activities at Sport House and offer administrative assistance. And I believe, and Creative Taupo believes, that uh, perceived inequality uh, could be verified or well, rectified by employing an art worker. And uh, I know that you've recently uh, um, had under discussion the uh, arts action plan, and I'm sure if you had an art worker, you could set that officer, he or she, uh, um, to to work straight away um, dealing with many of those points in that action plan. So uh, I, I do hope that you can give that some consideration in your deliberations. Um, other than that, uh, I'd Really nothing further to add. It, well, there is one thing that is always uh, that has bothered us for a while is the uh, um, the nature of the leases on the the AC reserve and the um, also on for um, um, organisations such as Active Arts on Redoubt Street. And uh, they have difficulty to um, make long-term plans because of those short-term leases. <laughs> and uh, I think if, if in the long term, if they are to progress, and, and they really need to have some surety in their term of lease. Yeah, Holly mentioned your submission of YPE. Yeah, you yeah. 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 Um, thank you, Holly and Andrew. Nice to see you. Um, just in regards to uh, um, the request for an increase, what sort of money are you talking about? Well, at the moment, as we said, we five to one is the ratio of money. So yeah, we get five dollars or five four to the one we can hand out. So any increase would be, I think, double it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
times five. <laughs> no problems. Well, it could be a problem. Councillor <laughs> I see you support the Pukaua uh, Festival. Uh, do you support anything else in the Turangi region? Uh, we have the um, arts works. What's, uh, sorry, the artworks. Artworks. Yes, we've supported the Kilmarnock down. The owner oh. of the Kilmarnock down there okay. as well. Yes, yeah, so yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. That was very appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? No. They are clear. Thank you. Good to see you, Andrew, and um, we'll certainly be deliberating and, and uh, you know, take your point as versus sport, or Andrew's point, um, you know, and so we always take that into consideration. So appreciate what you guys do for the young ones, uh, especially. We have had an arts coordinator before, haven't we, Andrew? Did we have? Um, yes, uh, some time ago. Yeah. Uh, Is that Karen? Uh, Karen Stephen, then Lucy Potter. Yeah. Um, then somehow the position was disestablished. Okay. I suppose because of um, um, reasons of um, economy or otherwise. You went here at the time, were you? Pardon? Uh, just uh, disestablished? Were you here? No. I don't believe so. No. Hey Holly, thank you. I know you're busy at Council in town and here and taking time out and being here this afternoon is truly appreciated. Thank you, Andrew, and good to see you. Oh, thank you very okay, much. Thank you for your time. No problem. Okay, next up we have Mr. Christopher Johnson from Myora Community Trust. Okay. So, and uh, trustee, no. Uh, Katie Noble is going to join us by Zoom. She's probably swanning that somewhere out in the Pacific Islands somewhere. Oh, okay. Neil, welcome. Exactly. <laughs> nice to see you, Neil. Good Formal to see you too. Yeah, David and councillors. Thank you very much. The unhired help. Thanks for coming. Uh, Katie, are you there? Yes, I sure am. How are you, sir? Yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Very nice of you to join us this afternoon. It's a beautiful day. Where are you? Uh, I am in Tauranga today, and you'll be pleased to know that it is um hissing down with rain and grey and horrible. I could imagine. No no problems at all. Good to have you, Katie. Hey, thank you, Chris. Welcome. Okay. Um, um, thank you very much. And first of all, I think we still within the trust pinch ourselves that we have the community has been allowed to rebuild the opportunity hospital on such a fine facility. It's absolutely incredible and we're quite excited about opening. I think it's building completion, I think, earlier this week. And so it's the final outfitting and then just sort of any teething problems. So I'd say a couple of months and we should be ready to go. Yeah. Right. So we are here to, to look at just some support for some underwriting for our business plan going forward. It's into the unknown we go because we have a a building um, the new model. Um, in the past, the trust has been basically the landlord. We've looked after the building for tenants and we have created a building that allows an entity to sort of manage social services for the community in a slightly different manner. Having an open plan office so there's more collaborative work or a space to have meeting rooms um, and that's the challenge for us is to go from where we've been with one paid employee to a, a model which needs to be managed. We've got a lot more operational costs. Um, we've got tenants fully 100% in the old buildings and we have a few expressions of interest for the new, but I think they're all waiting to see how it could work for them. Massive change for a lot of the agencies to go from a three metre square sort of office space to an open plan collaborative space. So I take it as read that you've seen our um, our budgets. Um, we've, I, 
great help of Neil Ward, who's the, the Excel guru, to, to work through some modeling for us because um, we're slightly under resourced. We have an admin person and a group of volunteers as, as trustees, and I've needed all the help. Um, Katie might just get her to start and sort of overview of what her role. We've engaged her as a consultant to do some of the initial work to uh, set the foundation for the new entity. So, Katie, would you like to just have yeah. an overview of what? Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, um, I have um, been working with the trust um, for quite a few months now. I have done some paid work and even more unpaid work, uh, which is my pleasure to do for the good of this community. Um, so the work that I've done um, with the uh, what we used to call tenants, so the members, um, we did a, a really big piece of co-design. So that means that uh, we did. I did lots of interviews, we did lots of workshops, and we really um, tuned in to people that have either used Wire House, are using Wire House, or have thought about using Wire House. Um, so past, present, and current um, socially focused organisations, and really looked at what they wanted the future for Wire House to be. Um, how do they want to work? What are they, you know, what is going to have the most impact for um, for their organisations and more importantly, the Fano that they serve? So um, out of all of those hours and hours and hours of work um, that it was my privilege to do, uh, we were able to come up with a completely co-designed charter. And that talks, um, that includes the co of how, how um, organisations want WIRA to work. Um, the, and how they see themselves in that future. So in terms of that's how we got there, what that actually means is, is that there's been loads and loads and loads of different opinions and different um, concepts thought about and all considered as we've written the new model. So um, being, being able to co-work, being able to collaborate, being able to know what services are offering what, in our community to be able to be in a space where they can have safe conversations to make referrals, to do warm handovers. So instead of saying, oh, here's, here's Mary's phone number, she'll be able to help you with your budgeting. You can actually say, just one moment, I'll go get Mary. It sounds like she'll be really able to help you, you know, and helping helping our clients and Fino feel really comfortable um, accessing. Um, the help that they need. One of the really key things that we ascertain through that co-design is that it takes a lot of courage um, to reach into social service. And it's really important that we meet that courage with our we, we meet that courage with love and we make it a really approachable place, um, a really friendly place and a place where the community can be proud to come in um, and, and either seek help or use, use um, the services that we've got there. We've got, uh, seven public meeting rooms. It's going to be, as a person that uses a lot of meeting rooms, it's going to be amazing. Um, and we're really, really, um, the, the feedback from potential members has been really strong. We do know, however, health and social service organisations are traditionally slow, traditionally uh, not early adopters of technology or change. So this is why this underwriting from, um, from TDC is so important. Um, because what we expect to see is a, is a, is a slow-ish uptake of spaces in the new house. Um, and currently the, the, the other wings are full. Um, and as people start to see how it works, they can feel confident about how they might fit into that space and then we'll start to see that move. Um, one of the key pieces of underwriting that is super important to us is the, um, is the underwriting for the role of general manager. Um, and that person is going to be really key in bringing the co papa to life, um, bringing energy to the role, bringing energy to the house, keeping people focused on working together, uh, making sure they're bringing, that, um, bringing the co papa to life. So that's a really important part of the underwriting that we've requested in, that, in one of Neil's amazing spreadsheets. So, um, yeah, we, that kind of support is going to allow us to move on. We actually can't recruit to that role until we've got this underwriting because that would be um, fiscally irresponsible of us. So that's something that we're we're really hopeful that's gonna be approved soon so we can move forward. Um, oh, excitingly in, um, in part of the co-design, um, uh, we actually found and located the first baby ever born at Wairau House. 
um, and I had a cup of tea with her a couple of weeks ago and she is um, super excited about the new house and she's going to come for a tour and bring her whānau. Um, I've told her, David, that she can cut the ribbon, not you. Um, so, yes, we're really excited to have um, Mata come and tour the site. And lo oh, yeah, thanks. lots, lots going on. Can you say the um, a general manager is that on top of the admin person? Yes. Yeah. The, we'll, sorry, Katie, carry on. Yeah, at the moment. Can, so there's a part time administrator at Wara um, House who has done an amazing job to date. The the GM requires a very specific high level set of skills around. Um, uh, bringing their own uh, brand of energy to the to the to the building but also knowledge of health and social services uh, budgeting being able to run um, a very lean ship um, on not and and, and manage to uh, managing lots of different moving parts so bringing the co-papa to life is a key part of what that manager will be doing and, and the existing they would be in charge of the existing complex as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Katie. Thank you for taking the time out. My <laughs> pleasure. And doing Thank you. Back to you, Chris. So a bit of past history. For 10 years or so, we received an admin grant of 55K. And we sat here three years ago requesting the same, plus a, a 30 grand change manager's role, which would have given us some funding to actually put a person in place to do what I've been and Neil and Katie have been doing in the last few years. Through some miscommunication, the 55 was taken out and the, the admin grant was reduced as a total to 30. So we actually came to a bit of a grinding halt because we were sort of up against our funding sort of model change. So we need to look at, as you've seen the, 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 the budget, we've been very lean and conservative in our approach. Um, if you look at the, the meeting rooms, I think will be the key, as Katie alluded to. I mean, we've done an hour a week as a budget for the for most of them, and then two hours a week for the big boardroom. So I think that's where we'll be okay. And, and what we're after is not a, a sum, it's an underwrite, just so we can remain on the right side of the belt or without being fiscally irresponsible. Cool. Thanks, Chris. How much? How much is it? Well, it's a three-year model. The first year is 120, yeah. um, down to 60 in the second year, and then breaking even in the third year. And you're saying that you did used to get 55. Yeah, we've oh. had 30 in the last three years. Because that, because of the facility not being or no, no. What happened is that when I asked for the 55, I asked for another 30 on top for a change manager to do the role. Katie and Neil have done, and somehow in communication, they thought that money was for a board over um, a review of the board, and just gave us thirty. I don't know what happened actually, but it made things a bit difficult. Okay. Well, Neil, um, is this? Can you make this work, please? Sorry, sorry, David. Can, you make it work? can I make it work? Of course, I can make it work. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's been um, it's been actually quite interesting to be involved in this, and um, we've done similar things in the past. Here, yeah, council has done similar things in the past. Here, with what we do with the eyesight, and it even has similarities to the dare I bring up the CV to LV transition um, in terms of what we did there. Um, so, um, really, it's a three-year underwrite, which is basically just a transition to get the pricing revenue streams for the trust. Um, to be sufficient to cover the ongoing operating, basically. So if you pick up on what Chris is saying there about it, would it the grant would have actually been 85 if it wasn't for a slight hiccup over three years, that's 255K. Um, what we're um, uh, forecasting in the in this three-year transition underwrite is actually 180K. So it's actually cheaper than what you would have been doing anyway if, if that had gone through. So we're pretty confident with the... Um, with the uptick in the in the rentals and the uh, the model for the for the Wairau House, um, that it will meet those. But it is an underwrite, so there's 
you know, like council budgets, there will be overs and unders. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty confident from the numbers that I've seen there that it's achievable. Um, at the moment, um, the other two wings, we got an appraisal through the real estate firm last year. Market rental would be $1,100 plus GST. As we're a landlord and mandated to be not for profit, they've been paying about 160 a month. So there's a massive difference. So we have um, regrettably put the, the rents for the old buildings up, and that, that brings it in line with the, the, um, the modelling we've done. So they at the moment pay for their own internet, and if you uh, if they came to the new building, they would actually it'll be uh, the figure would cover everything. So it gives them the ability to weigh out whether sitting in a three meters closed office or sitting in a collaborative space is the best. The the, the money won't be all just in the the rent they pay; it'll be in the outgoings that they currently have to pay themselves. So, you know, as you say, a good active general manager. Be able to create that revenue you know, as, time, as time goes on, as time goes on, just you know, uh, casual rate on the, the meeting rooms or anything like that, and some real good earning opportunities. You know. It's interesting, I think some confusion. I think people thought the building was built for the trust. To me, it's a community facility, no different to the library, or you just have um, handed the running of this to an independent trust. Uh, so we feel that our role is to actually support social services. Uh, and if you if council ran it, you'd have a full staffing contingent in there. We wish to be lean and mean and and run it as a, as a trust and sort of. So I think the model could work, but we do need support to get there. Cool. Thanks, Chris. It's okay. Going to be checking it in and say got enough room for some officers for us. Anyway, it didn't work. We, we did have a project team the other day who thought it looked quite good for them, but... Yeah. No, it looks fantastic for building really does. Now, questions, is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Councillor Shepard. Hello, thank you very much for your submission. Um, I've read through it with interest. Um, just a little uh, question for clarity of it for me. When you talk about charging rent on some of these rooms, did you... Did you say you are going to be charging market rent or you'll you'll try and keep that? No, we we will have to increase. And yeah. Percentage wise it is a little bit frightening, but dollar wise it's it's still well under the, we're going from 120 to 160 a month yeah. versus eleven hundred. Okay. And, and that's intended to be a gross list as well. A, a gross if you read the, the budget on the Tohara, I think you read it, it says there's like a twenty five percent in the next three years. Twenty five percent was yeah. And it's still going to be well under market rent. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank For you. example, when the building did come down, I think the food bank was paying eighteen thousand a year for their space. Mm -hmm. Market, they looked around town, and it was going to be forty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. So it certainly meets the need of supporting the social services, mm -hmm. which was the intent of allowing the, the maternity hospital to go into social services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the pricing is very much community rate, so to speak, um, and the transition is, as Chris said, 25% over the next four years for the existing tenants. Um, and then if on the meeting room stuff, if there is any slight commercial stuff, then they'll pay a commercial rate, but any social services will pay the social services rate. Councillor Green. Councillor Green, you're on mute. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, it looks fantastic what you're doing. Um, I just, I had a couple of questions that sort of came up when we were talking. So how do you differentiate between a social service and someone else if you are a social services builder? Okay, did you hear? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, as you can see from the charter and then the COPOP, it's socially focused organisations. So um, because of the zoning of the building, um, we're looking at there may be a, a smattering of commercial businesses that may use the meeting rooms um, and that supports um, supports our revenue income. But yeah, it is predominantly for um, socially focused organisations that may be social enterprise, that may be startup that are focused on solving some of the world's biggest problems. We don't know exactly how that's going to look, but um, the Kaupapa um, and the Charter is there to make sure that everybody feels supported and that we're attracting the right, that socially focused um, organisation. 
thank you for that, Katie. So do you currently have um, tenants signed up to take spaces in the building? We don't yet because um, we have just, um, we just launched the charter and took some of the members in past and present and current around um, last week. And we had three, three, um, three verbal signups. So it was really exciting. Um, and I think, you know, now the things like the carpet has gone down since then. It's really hard to see yourself in a, in a large concrete room. But I think now as the finishing touches go on, we'll be able to um, swing into action. Also, um, what we're doing is, is those, that, that will be the role of the, of, the, of the manager or the GM is to um, really get their teeth into uh, filling up that space. And obviously we're just a little hamstrung at the moment until we get this funding approved. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, Katie. Any other questions? Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. For, uh, Thank you. Looking at those uh, numbers, uh, truly appreciate. And um, yeah, the building's looking fantastic. But you know, it, it's going to be a little while to sort of get work out here. Uh, if anyone wants to have a visit, please be in touch and we can take you through. So. Yeah, and well done, Katie, for finding the first baby born. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, she's an absolute delight. Um, it's going to be. It's really. It's been an absolute pleasure of a project to work on and to continue working on. All right. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Okay, last next up we have Alana Phillips, the Nike. Hi, Alana. Oh. How are you? Good, does this work? Yeah. Or I can just talk loudly. <laughs> nice to see you, welcome. Thank you, nice yeah, to see uh, you too. Yeah, I've got the submission. The floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm here today representing the Topol Climate Action Group. Um, we're a local group with a membership, a current membership of around 40, and our purpose is to bring the people of the Topol District together to advocate for urgent strategic action on climate change within our district. Our submission on the annual plan was brief, but there are several key points I'd like to cover here today. Um, the first being that East Urban Lands the second being investigations into a new bridge, and the third being Council's next steps on your climate strategy. So I'll start with the East Urban Lands. Um, um, when considering the East Urban Lands development, we, we urge to, uh, Council to remember that your job is not just to serve the financial interests of the ratepayers, but to make decisions that will best serve the people of Taupo, um, now the Taupo district now and into the future. Um, we would like to see the EUL developed in a mixed housing model, which prioritises environmental sustainability, social inclusivity and economic resilience. A mixed housing model with a mix of housing types from affordable apartments through to family homes will foster social inclusivity, create diverse neighbourhoods and encourage empathy among Topol residents. The EUL site already has good links to the local school into the new commercial and retail spaces. Um, and this reduces dependency on long commutes and encourages the growth of small local businesses. Um, furthermore, encouraging denser development in urban areas promotes efficient land use. This combats urban sprawl and protects our valuable green spaces. Um, green spaces enhance the quality of life for residents and they also serve as essential carbon sinks which help reduce net carbon emissions. Um, such a model could be developed directly by council or potentially by private developers with a series of well thought out covenants that are put in place on the land. Uh, the second point I wanted to cover is the new bridge. Um, we note that investigations into a new bridge over the Waikato River have been signalled in the annual plan. We urge council to include assessment of the climate impacts of building a new bridge um, within these investigations. The financial and environmental costs of building a new bridge need to be considered against options such as expansion of commercial zoning in Nukaho to allow for development of retail, education and essential services 
to better serve the community locally and reduce the need for a commuting across the bridge and strengthening active and public transport routes to promote sustainable transport options, which can help reduce carbon emissions. And the final point I wanted to cover is Council's next steps on your climate strategy. We applaud Council's steps over the last two years in employing a climate policy analyst and adopting the, mission, the emissions reduction directive and the emissions reduction targets. Um, but now is the time for Council to take your next steps and define strategic climate goals, which will inform all Council decisions. These need to come from the Topo District community and the Council organisation as a whole, as it is community support which gives the mandate and Council staff that will be implementing the strategic objectives. Climate solutions will look different in the different communities in our district. What works in Taupo may not serve the community well in Turangi or Mangakino. Um, and in my opinion, the recent consultation on the REC strategy was a good example of how the community can be brought along on this process. So the actions we urge Council to take are to define your strategic climate goals, empower your staff to develop creative solutions and facilitate the community to engage with Council's vision. The outcome of this process will be a set of measurable targets that are total district specific, total district re relevant and total district achievable. And the East Urban Lands Project could be a case study on the implementation of this process. And then finally, we would like to acknowledge Council's progress on the, the continued development of cycling and shared use pathways in the district, the continued support of Indigenous planting by Greening Taupo, and the progress towards a more sustainable waste management model for our district. We encourage you to continue and accelerate your trajectory in these areas. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the appreciation. Right, the, the um, cycle and walkways are fantastic. You know? The new one going down Craven Road now. I'd like to work on that new one twice already. <laughs> Keep up myself, but anyway. Hey, good to see you, Lana, and thank you for the work you do. Um, really appreciate it. Might be a couple of questions, points of clarification. Is that okay? Yep. Councillors, anything there? Oh, Councillor Leonard. What a great submission. Thank you, Lana. It was really well thought out. Um, all of your points, I think, are very pertinent. Um, they require quite a lot of work, especially around those targets, um, having been involved um, in setting targets for some other organisations. Um, but I think we should be up for the challenge. Um, I guess I have a request. Uh, when you talked about the second brochure, you talked about Nokaho and education facilities. Um, I've just been involved in some discussions with the Ministry of Education. And I would implore you, if you wouldn't mind taking some of those paragraphs and sending a letter. Um, we're just in the process of schools being zoned and the concept of relocating schools to different spaces instead of looking at perhaps another school on that side of town seems to be the solution that they're coming up with, which I don't think is going to solve any of the climate issues. So um, just a plea from me to you, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing what was so eloquently written there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lennon. Any other questions, queries? No. Hey, clear and concise. Thank you, Alana. Good to see you. Thank you for taking time to come and see us today. We'll deliberate and we'll be back in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the meeting is now adjourned.